Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. We're going to call the meeting to order. Mr. Hudson, you have a vote. Okay, let's all bow our head for just a second. Heavenly Lord, I'm just so thankful to be here today and so thankful to have all these concerned citizens in this audience. They really care and what happens to their county matters. I pray that we will all be strong leaders, be righteous leaders, and always keep our eyes focused on you. With such a time in this world and everything coming at us all at one time, I pray, God, that you will help us to remember if we get on our knees as a nation and come to you, you will heal our land. Please guide us in this meeting and help us to always focus and keep our eyes on you to keep the main thing the main thing. In your heavenly name I pray, amen. amen. We can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
like that. Thank you, Kevin. Was not trying to do that. <laughs> if it gets heated, turn that phone back on. I'm a little bit worried how to get it off. <laughs> I might, I might indicate that several years ago, one of our well-known judges stood up in front of the entire crowd, his courtroom that day, and he announced, uh, anyone with a cell phone, cut it off. And if you don't, I'm going to have a bailiff confiscate it. And he did that, and then he sat down, and his cell phone went off. <laughs> Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, commissioners. This morning, I am presenting you with four proposed modifications to the county subdivision ordinance. Uh, these proposals were approved and recommended by the planning board during their July 11th meeting. These changes include, number one, increasing the minimum lot size for new subdivision lots served by well and septic systems from the current size of 30,000 square feet to a new size of 65,000 square feet, or roughly one and a half acres. Number two, increasing new lot minimums for watershed balance lots, also to 65,000 square feet. Number three, increasing the road frontage for cul-de-sac, the road frontage width, I'm sorry, for cul-de-sac lots from the current measurement of 20 feet to a new standard of 26 feet as measured along the cord. And finally, number four, creating a new width requirement for cul-de-sac lots of 175 feet at the building site while exempting new lots of two acres or larger from the width requirements. In approving these changes, the planning board issued the following consistency statement in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 160D-604D, quote, we find that this subdivision ordinance amendment is consistent with the following elements county land development plan, land use and agricultural policy recommendations. Recommendation 2.1, which, which encourages increasing lot size requirements and improving open space preservation in new development. And recommendation three, which is encourages reducing development pressure in rural and agricultural areas. I'd also like to note that a public hearing notice uh, for today's meeting ran twice in the Alamance News as uh, required by state law. And I do have a brief presentation uh, for you as well, just to give you a little bit of history on this issue and an example, just a rough example of how these regulations would work versus the current regulations. So again, this is today's proposal in summary. Again, item one there, a new lot size of 65,000 square feet or approximately an acre and a half. Number two, same thing with watershed lots, move that from an acre to 65,000 square feet. Number three, to increase the cul-de-sac width to 26 feet as measured along the cord. And then number four, a new width requirement for cul-de-sac lots of 175 feet while exempting any lots over two acres from the width requirements. So a little background and history on how this came about. So this actually predates my time uh, with the county. I've been here just about a year now, which I'm very proud to say. But at roughly 2022, 23, uh, current planning board chairman Rodney Cheek uh, first raised the issue before the board. In July of that year, in 23, the planning board uh, had a public input session uh, and the first uh, public discussion, I believe the first public discussion of the issue. In October of 2023, the planning board put together a lot size subcommittee to study the issue and make uh, recommendations. And then in March, earlier this year, March of 2024, the subcommittee presented their goals and recommendations. These are the goals that they presented at the time in the 2024 meeting, and I'll just read these one by one. To safeguard agricultural operations, to reduce environmental impacts on water resources, to reduce impervious surface, in surfaces and stormwater runoff, to allow for affordable housing options, to enhance community pride in conservation and preservation, and finally, to better preserve a predominantly rural development pattern throughout the unincorporated areas of the county. To follow those goals, they submitted the following recommendations. In other words, recommended changes to the subdivision ordinance in order to fulfill the goals. At the time, that was a recommendation of a two acre lot size minimum for residential subdivisions. Number two, to add more details to the cluster subdivision option, including requiring uh, preserved open space. Number three would be to allow be to allow for a planning board review and approval option and to attach conditions to those developments. 
And then finally, to require a 50-foot buffer between new subdivisions and farms, parks, historic districts, churches, and schools. The planning board debated those specific issues and a more <coughs> robust uh, set of changes to the subdivision ordinance in the May and June meetings. But ultimately, that was voted, not really voted down, but it deadlocked in a four to four tie in the June meeting with uh, one member absent. And so as a result, the proposal did not advance at the time. When you say one member, we know, but the audience does not know, that means planning board. Planning board members, members. yes, sir. It's a nine member board and the vote was four to four with one, ab with one uh, absent. So then in July 2024, Planning Board Chairman Roddy Cheek reintroduced a narrower fo focus on just the 65,000 square foot lot size with the other um, <clears throat> components and width requirements that I've detailed here. So I want to get into, you might call it a, a rough example of how these regulations would work, kind of the current regulations versus uh, what is proposed by using a hypothetical 10 acre lot. So again, these are just kind of rough numbers. I think there's probably some play in the joints here, but I did want to give you a little bit of an example of kind of a before and after, or at least current versus proposed. So here you have, um, obviously, uh, award-winning uh, uh, design skills here that I put <laughs> together myself. But you've got a standard public road on the left-hand side and a vacant or an empty 10-acre lot there in the, in the broad middle. So as the current regulations work with a 30,000 square foot lot size, if you do the math on 10 acres, uh, 10 acres comes out to 435,600 square feet. If you divide that by 30,000, the number you get is 14.5. Um, when you factor in soil conditions, topography, installing a road, other variables, I think you can safely say in that type of scenario, you'd probably be in the neighborhood of 12, maybe 13, but maybe 11 lots as the regulations currently read today. With the proposed regulations and the um, moving up of the minimum lot size to 65,000 square feet, if you divide that 10 acres by 65,000 square feet, I think you could easily argue six. The number you get is 6.7. I think you could easily argue six, but just for the sake of an example today, the rendering here shows five lots based on the, um, the, the proposed 65,000 square foot metric. And then just a couple of minor features here on the end there with regards to the width requirements. So the diagram there just shows the 26 feet measured along the cord of a cul-de-sac lot as well as the width requirement at the building site. So that brings us back to today's proposal again. In summary, you've got the changes to the lot size uh, minimum, watershed lots, and the other width requirements there. Make sure I didn't miss anything. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have before entertaining public comments. Let me indicate that currently one acre is 43,560 square feet. Um, you go to um, the new requirement of 65,000, that would be 1.492, 1.947 square feet which means an acre and a half rounding off <laughs> just thought that would be of interest yes sir i have a question before we go into the public particularly item number uh, under lot size um looks like it's g roman numeral two going from 20 feet for our public street or private road shall have a minimum of 20 feet to 26 feet. Is that a fire requirement? What's the reason for going to that change? Are you referring to the street frontage for cul-de-sac lots? Right. Yes, sir. So I think in general there was an interest in, um, you know, we have planning board members here and they can speak to this as well, but in well, general... The question is, not what the interest is, is there a fire requirement? That was not part of the planning board's discussion, no sir. For Specifically for that. With other road regulations and access issues, yes, fire fire safety is a, is a concern, but not specifically for the cul-de-sac lots. Right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just for clarification, because I'm not a builder, 
Can you just enlighten everybody that's watching in here and out there what watershed is? We hear that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, watersheds are areas of land where, uh, just to put it plainly, the, the rainwater that falls there eventually makes its way into a drinking water source. So a vast majority of the county is covered in one watershed or another, uh, particularly in the northern half of the county. Watersheds are divided into two areas. So you've got the critical area, which is the immediate half acre to the top of the bank of the water body. And then outside of that, just based on topography and water flows, that's where you have the balance. So currently in the county, the balance for new lots in the, or the, the acre minimum requirement in the balance of watersheds is one acre, but in the critical area, it's two acres. And the mechanism there is really to control density and development because if you have a lot of density, you've got a lot of impervious surface, you've got more runoff, you've got more contamination in the, in the water bodies. So the lot size minimum there is really a mechanism to control density, to mitigate against runoff and erosion into the drinking water sources. Okay, so when it has a Noah's Ark rain, we see what happens to the city park. Is this kind of that situation with all those houses, the park restaurant, all that around it. I mean, that's just what happens, but is that what you're talking about? And also, like we hear about PFAS, that's gone all the way down to Chatham County and Pittsburgh. I mean, that's a big issue too. So is that sort of kind of in that area? Yes, ma'am, Rough, roughly yes, I would okay. say yes. I mean, the more, let's say you get a real heavy rain event, the more grass and forest and shrubs and vegetation right. that that rain passes through, that, that stormwater passes through before it makes its way into the lake or the stream or the river, the cleaner it's going to be. Okay. So this is just a mechanism to... Like a filter. Yeah. Okay. It's to enhance the natural filter of the water. Yes, You know you need me working for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not. It's a great question. Any other questions before we go into the public hearing? Is there a motion to go into the public hearing? So moved. Second. Second. Go ahead. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of going into the public hearing? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Announce. We're now in a public hearing. Um, <clears throat> well, I ask you to keep it relatively brief. One. Two, it needs to be on this topic only. You don't get into other issues and so forth. It's this only. Uh, anyone on this side of the Room. To speak? To speak? Yeah, yes, sir. to yeah. speak. All right. Sir, stand. Me? Yes, sir. Uh, come around to the podium. Sir, there's a three when minute. You, when you three raise your limit. hand after each speaker, just raise your hand, I'll acknowledge, and then, of course, go to the podium. There's Whoever's a three minute. Next, go ahead and line up. There's a three minute limit on public speaking, just a reminder. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And this one does not have the half hour limit right. because it's a public hearing as opposed to public comments. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. State your name. Uh, uh, Chris Faust, 4990 Highway 62 South Burlington. I'm a septic and uti utility contractor as well as a developer. Now, I've been here for the last, I think, 13 months since they started uh, talking about this. You know, everybody, we've all had challenges the last four years since. It's no, it's, you got, you already got cost increases, inflation, shortages, and now we got more tax increases here. But I'm gonna do an example. A three hundred thousand dollar house four years ago, two two point seven five was around a thousand dollars a month, nine seventy nine. <clears throat> now that same house is seventeen hundred dollars a month. The lot when we go to the lot prices, a thirty also a thirty year was sixty at sixty thousand dollars. Now at seven point seven five. It's $429 a month if you do it over 30 years, a part of that down payment, or that payment, I'm sorry. If we do this, we're gonna double the size. I mean, you've seen, they shot yourself in the foot with the, uh, the example there. It's already showing they want it affordable, but we just cut, cut it in less than half. We're having to put twice the street, twice as much street in, we're getting half the lots. So <clears throat> that same, that's four or $500 a month over 30 years that we're adding right here just with one decision. I mean, I know there was some personal agendas here. I, we've heard it. But this county, you can't, this can't be personal, y'all. 
this, this has got to be, we, you've got, and I don't want y'all to think about it for 13 months like they did, but we've got to, we've got to be easy, easy in this. This, this is, this is forever. This is like, this is like, prop, this is like, goes back to the income tax. That was going to be temporary. This is a long time deal we're talking about. I'm a former farmer. I know that it's important, but in my mind, 30,000 square foot, we, we're fine. I think we're, a lot of us are fine with acres, but there's times you need 30,000 square feet. You got every lot's different, everything, the soil different, the soil's different on everything. Topography, topography and if I ain't mistaken, and the planner can tell, an acre and a half lot is what we're averaging giving you right now. So if you, you're going to hold our feet to the fire for an acre and a half, we're going to be coming here with three acre lots minimum just because of the way the road's being designed and everything. And the, uh, the, the lot size committee, I've seen that. I, this is the first time I've seen that. I, don't remember, I think all the members on that lot size committee were planning board members. I, we weren't invited. I don't know if any of these other developers were in here and invite, were invited or not. But I talked to a well contractor yesterday. There's been some issues about the wells. He, they've been drilling wells, Manus and Son, been drilling wells since 1956. He said there was places to hard, hard to find water in 1956. He said there's the same way now. He said, but the places where there, there's water, there's no, he said there's no difference in all their years of drilling. So in closing, I just, it's 30,000 square feet now. They said we got a, a uh, option of a smaller lots, but this planning board here will never do that. So I just want y'all to think about this before you make this call. Thank you. And we thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, who's going to be following this gentleman? Raise your hand. Anybody on this side? I'm sorry. Yeah. Who's going to be next following this gentleman? Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Jeff Allred. I live in Snow Camp, 8065 Cobble Mill Road. I uh, see the who's who of uh, Burlington builders and real estate developers here today, and I'm sure this is certainly a concern for them. Um, but I'm going to speak on behalf of a, of a landowner, um, you know, the, the rich farmer who, can, who has all this land. He can go buy his groceries with a bucket of dirt. Um, the uh, the fear-mongering number that the planning board used was 100 acres. Uh, that you could get 133 houses on 100 acres. And, and my 80-year-old father-in-law, who's got 232 acres and nothing but farmland around him, pretty much crapped a brick. He's like, oh, my God. And I had to explain to him, and, and I think Matt addressed this, you know, there's topography limits and there's, uh, there's soil limits. You, you never get that. But if you can get 80% uh, of that, um, you, you've done a great job from a development standpoint. So uh, the, the fear-mongering number, you know, 133 houses. Uh, it, if, you, if you did an acre, you know, obviously those, that's 100. Um, but if you go down to an acre and a half, that's 67 lots. So what you've done is you've cut that in half um, for what a, a farmer who's worked his whole life, and that's all he's got. He's got land. That's all he's got. It, farmers don't get rich. Um, so basically, um, for what you can pay for land, now you've either cut that in half, or now the, the farmer, if he needs money, he's got to double how much he sells. So uh, you're, you're really putting the farmer in, in a bad position, or the property owner in a bad position, for where, um, for, for him to be profitable, if he were to ever decide, hey, I'm tired of farming, I want to go buy a house at the beach, I want to sell my farm. Um, and, and I saw one of your issues was talking about affordable housing. I don't know how you restrict lot size and think that's going to give you affordable housing. For me, that, that's, the buck should stop right there. there. This does nothing to help affordable housing by making the lots bigger. There's zero benefit to um, um, affordable housing. Um, now, I've, I think they had about six meetings on this that I attended. Um, there might have been three people showing up worried about it. Now, the, they did, the, the planning board did their due diligence. They brought in a well guy and a septic guy, and the septic guy said septic systems are designed to last forever. And the well guy said, it's a crapshoot, you know, <laughs> and, and it's always going to be a crapshoot with a well. 
So, um, I, and I just feel like that this thing, you know, there was an agenda being pushed by, by the planning board for whatever reason, and I just didn't see the, the support for it as I, as I saw the, the support against it in the, in the meetings. And I hope you guys take that into account as uh, you make your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you next? Yes, sir. And the next person, go ahead and wind up in this corner so you can be ready, please. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jeff Thronberg. I'm a local home builder <clears throat> and the president of the uh, Alamance Castle Builders Association. I've been to uh, many of these planning board meetings and spoke and provided, like a, a lot of people did, nothing but data of what was going on in the community, what average house cost, what the lot cost, and what the increase in the lot size was going to cost the average homeowner. Chris Faust addressed on that. He's 100% right. I provided that data. It's $400 a month just by increasing. So the medium price of an acre lot was around $50,000. medium price of a two-acre lot, $72,000. The numbers don't lie. It fell on deaf ears with the planning board. <clears throat> Myself and everybody provided that. Uh, Wilson Mize, who was the well expert they was talking about, has run the two, uh, North Carolina Well Department since 2008. Every, every concern they had about wells, septics, he debunked that. Every fact that we've given them, they just blew it off. It was, it's really frustrating because us as leaders, whether elected or appointed as planning board, are to support and what's best for the Alamance community citizens. Not hinder them, not strap them down. I've never once talked about how it was going to affect my business because in the leadership role I'm at, that's not what's important. What's important is that I can't build a house for a 24-year-old couple that's just trying to start a family. Now we're going to cripple them even more. So if you want to increase the lot sizes, which it was a personal agenda, the reason I know that, Mr. G went to the Home Builder Association and told our executive officer. He's the one that did this. As a leader, we can't do that. We can't have that. So if you want to increase lot sizes, you better be willing to build cheap apartments because we can't build them houses. So anyway, I, I ask that you would consider this. This is just, we're not here. Oh, since uh, 2019, the average lot size, 74% of the lots approved in Alamance County were 70,000 square feet, okay? We don't need this lot size creep to, to cripple the developers, the builders, or the financial burden on the homeowners. So I asked you would talk, meet with us, local community, especially the citizens, see how this affects them before you make a decision. Thank you. And we thank you. Ms. Graves. And next person after Ms. Graves, go ahead and get in the corner, please. <laughs> We're not having you stand in the corner as punishment, but it will are for speed. <laughs> thank you. Sandy Ellington Graves. I live in Southern Alamance County. As a local real estate agent for more than 20 years, I've seen the housing market at its best, at its most challenging, and everything in between. In June of 2021, I was appointed to serve on the planning board. A year later, and just months after the failed snow camp zoning plan, a member of the planning board suggested the minimum lot size should be increased from 30,000 to five acres. The primary objective was to stop development in the rural parts of the county. The planning board debated this issue for months. I was asked to chair a subcommittee. I asked realtor colleagues, home buyers, landowners, appraisers, environmental health, land developers about the potential impact. I quickly learned that many people were not aware that lot sizes were even being discussed. In November, I shared a full report from the subcommittee that I chaired. The conclusions included general agreement that a minimum one acre lot size is a gracious plenty that the majority of the lots approved over the last five years are already more than one acre in size, and that the increase to lot size is added to the financial burden of housing affordability. After more than two years of debate, no one has been able to identify a compelling reason to more than double the current requirement of 30,000 square feet. Our population has increased 18% over the last 10 years, ranking Alamance County 15th in our state. Our county is just over 423 square miles. In 2020, cities and towns, including the ETJs, accounted for 100 of those square miles. 108 square miles for watershed, and 155 were noted as farms. This leaves just 61 square miles of vacant land. That's just over 39,000 acres, 
and less than 15% of this county. As a realtor and a lifelong citizen, I understand the importance of managing growth with a balanced approach to protect the integrity of our county, to protect our fam farmland, and to protect the 184,000 people who choose to live here. Most importantly, please know I appreciate the work of the planning board and the importance of today's recommendation. I believe, unfortunately, as many others do, that a one acre lot size is more appropriate to update the ordinance. Thank you. And we thank you as well. No one else on this side, anyone else on this side of the room that would like to speak? All right. This side, gentleman in the corner. I'll get to you. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Nolan Kirkman. I reside at 1908 Glenkirk Drive in Burlington. I'm a licensed professional engineer and also hold licenses in general and electrical contracting. I recently retired from the city of Burlington where I oversaw development and the creation and administration of the city's UDO. I'm now working with the local land developers. Hopefully I can provide a balanced perspective on the proposed changes. From my experience, local governments are constantly seeking to find the appropriate balance as it relates to development regulations. Now, too much regulation stifles development and not enough makes it difficult to, to achieve a community's vision. Given property tax revenues are the lifeblood for cities and counties, it's critical not to overregulate in such a way that new tax base can't keep up with typical increases in annual expenditures. The key point I would like to make is that proposed changes are overscaled and will have significant impacts, some of which may not be intended or desired. Approving them would reflect a significant change in how the county approaches density and would have major implications for a number of community metrics. The first I will mention is the preservation of rural land. Feedback received during the land development plan included the appreciation of the rural character of the county. With the proposed changes, if you assume the demand for housing and production remains constant. Rural property would be consumed at twice the rate to produce the same number of units. It may be more strategic to consider employing denser development with reasonable buffer and viewshed treatments. This would allow the life of rural areas to be extended while balancing the visual impacts of new development. Secondly, the tax revenue generated by development under the new standards could drop significantly reducing 300 units to 150 units for the same land area would cost the county approximately 300,000 in perpetual annual tax revenue. And equally unfortunate, current property owners could see diminished land, value, uh, val land values because for res residential developments to pencil, land prices must be within a certain range. And from the data shown in the LDP, the primary potential for growth in the unincorporated tax base is from single family residential, which currently makes up 44% of that area's taxable value. In evaluating the LDP, the primary areas for single family growth are in the vacant and rural residential areas, which make up about 40% of the unincorporated area. At the current standards, that represents about $70 million in potential tax growth with single family development. The proposed changes would cut that potential in half. Given the county is average budgeting around $5 million in new tax growth over the last four fiscal years, it may be prudent to, to view the remaining area as a limited resource for reasonable, reasonably dense single family development that can help keep the tax rate low for years to come. In summary, I would suggest that the proposed changes are grossly overscaled and that a better approach to preserving rural land, promoting prosperity for landowners, preserving tax base potential, and keeping a low tax rate is employee density development with proper viewshed and buffer regulations. Thank and we you. thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm Ken Walker, uh, 135 Pepper Tree Drive in Mebane. Uh, I am a, I'm the former chair of the county planning board. Um, also a co-owner of REMAX Diamond Realty for Alamance County, and recently been appointed uh, by Mebane Council 
to be a Medman Advisory Board member to update the comprehensive land development plan for Medman. I spent some time listening to the logic and the lack thereof from the Planning Board to bring forth this proposal today. At least several of the current members of the Planning Board have made this an issue not for the betterment of landowners in Alamance County, but for the betterment of their own privacy and personal agenda. In essence, this recommendation is a backdoor way of imposing additional steps toward countywide zoning without calling it such. This ordinance change that is being recommended is not necessary for several reasons. One, the soils throughout our county are sporadic at best to support large septic system communities. In addition, with the necessary requirements for space separation from well septic systems and also designing um, a perkable site for repair area, we are already limited in what size the lot needs to be to, in order to build a house. This restricts what density can be developed in rural areas. Secondly, we have in place watershed and stream buffer and Jordan Lake rules that also govern the use of the land near or adjacent our wetland systems throughout the entire county. Third, we don't need to add an additional layer of government overreach that affects the landowners of Alamance County. Currently, we continue to have a historic housing shortage in all price ranges, particularly with affordable housing for the working family and the first time home buyer. This new proposal would add significant cost to the new home construction that will be passed along to the Alamance County consumer. The American dream of home ownership is being a much more difficult reality than it was in times past. According to the mission of the Alamance County Planning Board, and I quote, the mission of the Alamance County Planning Board is to be response to needs of its citizens by providing leadership, guidance for the comprehensive, thoughtful, and orderly growth and development of our land based upon respect for our, reach, our rich history, culture, and fairness to our citizens. If this board moves forward with adopting these recommended changes, then please stop incentivizing other industries to come to our area. We cannot afford business growth because we don't have housing to support it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vines, are you next? He's been nailing down that corner all, uh, all day. So <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Henry Vines, and I reside at 3450 Isley Drive in Snow Camp. And I'm a farmer. And I'd just like to address a few things that's been said. As a farmer, this is not going to restrict what I can sell my land for. I can sell my land for what I want to sell it for, whether it be industry, whether it be uh, for residential. If I, whatever I want for my land, that's what I'm going to get. And this, this, this acre and a half is not going to affect me of what I can sell my land for. Secondly, as it was said about the tax base, that this increases the tax base of the county. Well, for every house that's built, it costs the taxpayers, and their, their um, usage is a dollar and 40 cents for every dollar they pay in. So every house that's built is costing an additional 40 more cents. Who takes that up? Us farmers, because we got hundreds, we got 100 acres or whatever we got, and our cows don't go to school. <laughs> so we are basically subsidizing all these houses that are being built. Secondly, uh, we're trying to preserve the rural part of our county. This is the rural part. This is the country. This is not the city limits. We don't want it to become looking like the city limits. This acre and a half, as many have said here, is already in most cases. So what's the big issue of making it all the way across the county so that each lot is going to be an acre and a half? And we talk about the, the Lake Jordan rules. I very much admire those rules. I work hard on those rules. The farmers 
of this county are the ones that are allowing for the rules to take place because of our land that's in grass, it goes toward the impervious surface. As we keep on taking away from this, it reduces that amount of, in, of impervious surface area. So what's going to happen is something's going to have to, somebody got to make it up. And we can't make it up when, we, when land's being lost. So by increasing the lot sizes to acre and a half, you've got the impervious surface that will take care of that house on its own. You ain't got to go out and find some out more. So uh, I'm in favor of the two acres, uh, but this board worked hard. They come to agreement, and it's, it's an eight to one vote on this. We agreed on an acre and a half. We feel like this would be the best route that we can take to preserve the rural integrity of our county and our heritage. And I appreciate you passing this and moving forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone, anyone else on this side of the room? Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Dwight Epperson. I reside at 1314 Springwood Church Road. Burlington address, but it is a Guilford County property. And the reason I would speak today to this county, <clears throat> my heart has been in this county. I've been a licensed real estate agent for 45 years. And I'm fortunate enough to work with uh, Mr. Walker over here in Fine Group. I do primarily land development more so than other things. And I've been, I've been doing it for a while, and I've seen a lot of changes. But the one thing that has been a permanent standard when it comes to developing land is the land will tell you what size your acre is going to be because you would have to have a perfect world for somebody to get 30,000 square feet everywhere they go you know topography issues and in addition to that uh, the soil's got to cooperate it's got to be perkable soil and it's very difficult to find that if this passes I have a I have a client who is selling her property for retirement under contract. If this passes and it goes into effect, that deal's over. I can tell you that right now. It will be gone. And she she would obviously not be very happy, and she is a resident of this county for sure. So we, we don't want to see that happen. But I will tell you this. The people who want the larger tracts of land we don't have to pass a law for them. If they want five acre minimum, if they want 50 acre minimum, they can do it. They can pass to their children whatever size lot they want to. But the average person out here trying to get started cannot afford a larger lot right now or, and the larger cost. When you go to a larger lot, the people that sell, they can't make as much money because the, the, the uh, developers can't afford to give more money and raise the price of the houses. We're already in a struggling economy. This is the wrong time for this. It really is. It's, it's not practical right now because it's hard enough for people to experience the American dream. You hear about that all the time on the news. Well, it's just about gone just because of interest rate. So the combination of, of adding to it a more difficulty and more costs for that home they can kiss it goodbye. The people that will have the American dream will be the children of the farmers. Thank you. And we thank you as well. Anyone else on this side of the room? Anyone else standing? Oh, uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Todd Lambert, 1237 Hanford Hills Road in Graham. I'm a professional engineer by trade. I've done developments and design developments in Alamance County since 1996. I also have over 10 years experience with local government where I wrote, developed, and implemented lots of codes, regulations, and specifications. I previously served on your county uh, planning board for six years, including two years as your chairman. The proposed rules have been pushed to you by the current planning board as a personal agenda. I don't believe they solve a problem that exists outside of the planning board itself. Um, the proposed changes of 65,000 square foot is a burden on the county. Uh, the health department will always dictate how, how big and where your lots are going to be based on the, the perking and the soils themselves. Uh, some people have commented that the average lot now is 70,000 square foot. 
Uh, but if you raise the minimum, then you're going to raise the average. That's how math works. Um, I did an evaluation of a random subdivision I chose through GIS, Evansville subdivision off of Payne Road near Saxbaha. Uh, this was just under 58, uh, almost 59 acres. It yielded 53 lots in 2019. That means that they lost 38% of their gross value due to roads, irregular lot shapes, and based on where their soils were. So you never get to develop 100% of your gross land anyway. If you applied the current rules as they are proposed to this subdivision, uh, this subdivision, which originally had 53 lots, averaging uh, almost 45,000 square feet per lot, you would have lost 20 lots in that subdivision. So that one subdivision that was 58 acres originally yielded 53 lots, you would have lost 20 of those lots under these new rules. That subdivision is completely built out, which means the market is demanding and, and saying that 30,000 square foot to one acre lots is what the market is looking for. Uh, that subdivision completely built out has an average tax value of over $470,000 per house. Take 20 of those off and that's almost $9.5 million that you just removed from the county's valuation. The other issues with some of the, the proposed zoning, particularly the lot width at the cul-de-sac, I'm not sure the planning board, when they were having their discussions, realized the implications that you would have if you put a 175-foot lot width at the building line for a cul-de-sac lot. Even if you take the proposed regulations of a 26-foot wide lot at the cul-de-sac, if your lot lines are radial, that means that your building setback on that cul-de-sac lot is going to be 275 feet. So the proposed regulations are going to put a cul-de-sac lot, the house has to set almost a football field off of the road. That is not going to be affordable housing if you're going to have to build a 300-foot uh, long driveway. The 26-foot 26, the 26 lot width, which I, I appreciated your question, Chairman, didn't even address where it came from. It was completely arbitrary. So again, I would ask that you not propose these rules as they are completely arbitrary uh, for a personal agenda of your planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this side of the room? Any other speakers at all? And I assume there's no waiting room or... No, there's not. All right. No overflow. No. no. Okay. Do we have a motion to close the open hearing? So moved. Sorry. Have a motion and a second. He, he said it quietly, <laughs> but I heard him. Uh, any other discussion prior to closing the public hearing? There being none, all in favor of closing the public hearing signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Okay, we are out of the public hearing. Uh, Ms. Thompson? Uh-uh. I don't want to go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Turner. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank everybody who came out today to, to provide information. I certainly learned uh, a lot this morning um, about topography, about soils, about lot size, how that affects lot size that I hadn't considered before. I appreciate that. Thank the planning board for the work they did on this, um, whose motivations I can tell are nothing more than to uh, advance the goals that they set and that have been provided in public. I, I don't cast any dispersions there at all. Thank you for your work. Um, I, I have some questions related to some of the comments today that are a little bit off topic, but I, I think relate to the goals. Um, if we're talking about preserving the rural nature of the, of the county outside the municipalities that we're talking about, um, in connection with some of the comments about topography dictating how many lots you can have on a given uh, tract, um, every lot's different. Uh, you know, soils are also determining uh, how, and obviously what can work and what can't. Um, I, I looked at the cluster development section of the of the mm -hmm. existing ordinance and I think there was some talk about that that was part of a consideration that got bypassed 
isn't that part, couldn't that be part of the answer that if we're incentivizing cluster developments, we're, we're allowing, we're developing what the land will allow you to develop. And mm -hmm. couldn't there be denser, a denser part <coughs> in the area of a particular piece of land that would allow it and not a non-dense, you know, a, a less dense part for other parts of that? Mm -hmm. Is that something that we're, that we're thinking about? Well, it's certainly it. something that the planning board has thought about. And like I said in the presentation, they debated that uh, pretty heavily in May and June. So the, I think the goals at the time and the recommendations largely worked hand in hand. So one of the goals being rural preservation and uh, preservation of open space in a cluster development, just kind of going back to the hypothetical 10 acres that I put up, you might imagine it as five acres over here on the western side of the property would be packed in with all of the homes, all of the lots. And then the five acres on the other side of the property be, would be reserved for a neighborhood park, uh, community space, trails, greenways, whatever the case may be. So you could see how if there's a desire to preserve open space and preserve a rural aesthetic, having a clustering and having a preservation of that open space in one aspect of the neighborhood would buffer against the next door neighbor if that's a farm or buffer against the, the public road so that you don't see the new development even though it's there that that type of thing does that answer your question is there a way to incentivize that thinking in terms of allowing development based upon what the land gives you I, that's an excellent question i'm not sure that there's a way to necessarily incentivize it the original draft that we came up with basically gave developers three options if we were going to have a larger lot size option we call those conventional subdivisions so you come in you do your two lots or in today's case an acre and a half Every lot could be about two acres. Obviously, the science dictates otherwise, but just for the sake of argument. Then you would have the clusters, as we just discussed. Then we wanted to allow for a third option, which would be um, kind of a special use permit avenue for developers to go before the planning board. And they would come to the county and say, I've got this piece of land. I've got, um, you know, instead of a two acres, most of my lots are about an acre, acre and a half. I want to reserve some open space, but it's not up to what the cluster requires. It's kind of something in between. And so they would have that parachute, if you will, or that third option to go before the planning board if it wasn't a conventional subdivision or a cluster. So I don't know if it necessarily incentivizes it. Um, certainly if we had tools like zoning, that could probably be a stronger incentive, but we did, in, at least in the initial draft, want to allow for multiple options. Uh, through that, through, for the development process. Well, when we were considering a small area plan, um, it did include some uh, express language about clusters. Yes, sir. I thought made sense. Um, another question I had, there was, um, you noted that what, another thing that was abandoned with the planning board had an approval procedure. Right. I, I didn't understand what that was. So it, it would be necessarily um, a complex process, but like I mentioned, if the subdivision ordinance allowed for two main options, for a conventional larger lot subdivision or for a cluster subdivision, but a developer came to the county with something that was in between, right? So for example, the cluster subdivision would say, again, just rough math, 50% of your acreage has to be reserved open space. Now, that's a little too much, but just for the sake of argument. But the proposal came into the county and they said, I can't do 50%, I can do 25%. Of, of this 50 acres as reserved open space. So they would have to procure a special use permit. They would have to go before the planning board. The planning board could attach other conditions to that development and say, okay, um, you know, we'll approve your lots as they are, even if they don't fit the other two categories. And in this open space, we want to see a trail or it backs up to a creek. So we want to see a, a, a greenway or a, a, a walking path along the creek or something like that. They could attach through the special use permit option, they could attach conditions to that third way of a development approval. And, and now if there were a similar request, that request would go to the Board of Adjustment? Now all subdivisions are approved administratively. So there is no, that, that hypothetical planning board review and approval died when that uh, previous version deadlocked four to four. So we still have it as a draft, you know, in the computers at the planning department. Well, if but a developer wants to change the, their subdivision from, from the what's required, mm -hmm. there's a process that they can obtain. A yes, that's that true. That would go through the Board of Adjustment. That would have to go through the variance process of the Board of Adjustment, okay. yes, sir. 
Are there different areas of the county which ought to have different lot sizes? That ought to have different lot sizes? Right. Different I think, lot minimums. I think you could certainly make the case. Uh, again, that would be more in line with a hypothetical zoning um, uh, ordinance for the county. But I think you could, if, if, if you want to strike a balance between development and a diversification of land uses and by virtue a diversification of your tax base, but also preserve open areas. I think you can make an argument that it makes sense to have denser development, ideally with public utilities, in and around the existing cities and towns and ETJs, and then reserve more open rural space, possibly with a larger lot size regulation out in the further reaches of the county. Denser lot sizes closer to municipalities. Correct, yeah. So smaller lot sizes, cluster subdivisions, like we're talking about, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, apartments. Um, to me, if it, w it would make sense, again, it would probably have to come through a hypothetical zoning ordinance, but to, to put density where there already is density, right? right? And then uh, leave the, the outer portions of the county open and rural. What input did the planning department have with the planning board in coming up with these recommendations? Well, we provide them a lot of data. Uh, if they have any hypothetical questions about how the ordinance changes would affect the day-to-day -day administration of the ordinance, um, we sat in on all of the lot size subcommittee meetings. We talked to them about watershed data. We talked to them about how the general statutes govern what they can and can't do. Uh, we had a pretty lengthy discussion about the special use permit process, as you might imagine. So we just provided them as much technical data and, and um, resources as, as we could throughout their discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Let me just make a comment here. Um, sec section X in the current um, code calls what it entitled minimum lot size area for res residential lots. We're not covering anything inside any municipality. You live in a city, they have their own codes, regulations, so this is not impacting any of that. We cannot trump what the cities have already done. But we have three primary areas. One is watershed critical area. That means we're directly impacting a water resource. Uh, and that could be one of our reservoirs, it could be any number of things. Uh, and it is currently two acres minimum. So cannot build anything or have a lot size of less than two acres in those areas. Uh, the second is balance of watershed or BOW as a, everything has to go, you educators know everything has to have an alphabetical name. So, uh, but the uh, BOW, currently has a one acre lot size, um, which is um, 43,560 feet. The proposal is to go to one and a half acres, which is 1.49 or one and a half acres. Uh, so that's, yeah, we go, it, well you saw the drawing with that 10 acre lot. So it's going to cut those lot sizes. It's going to double them, therefore cut those in half. Then you have non-water water shed areas, or NWAs. So, <laughs> um, and that currently is a 30,000 square feet. They're talking about going to 65 of the proposal is 65,000 square feet, which is um, well, about one and a half acres. One acre is, is exactly one and a half acres, or just a fraction within that. Uh, so everything would be, and the 30,000 minimum would be 65,000 again, in any, regardless of watershed or anything else. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, I asked a couple of the planning board members, what's your real goal? Uh, some said preserve farmland. Some said uh, we don't want to be Guilford County. 
population-wise. We don't want cluster housing. I got all kinds of different areas. Uh, and Ms. Graves, who used to be on the planning board and she probably should be today, uh, you know, is a realtor. And so a lot of you builders and realtors are going to be the most impacted if we grant this or vote for this change. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. The reason I ask you, sir, the question uh, going with the uh, measurement along the cord, currently 20 feet and going to 26, I was concerned, is there some fire code somewhere? And you indicated no. So th th how do they, do they just pluck that out of the sky? How do they go from 20 to 26? Well, I actually called this morning to, to double check with the chairman of the planning board, and he enlightened me that um, uh, the installation of a culvert would be would result in about 20 feet. And so uh, get the culvert in, and then you'd have a little bit of space on either side of the driveway. So culvert in at 20 and then a little bit of space on either side uh, gets you up to 26. And there was just, there was general debate uh, whether it was cul-de-sac lots or others about increasing lot widths, um, you know, a, a desire to have a buffer between new homes and new subdivisions. Um, I can't recall all of the uh, details of uh, all of the, uh, the uh, uh, details of the conversation, but they ultimately just landed on 26 for the cul-de-sac lots. We've had a lot of discussion from speakers, uh, pro and con, for this vote. Uh, but it particularly concerns me that we're really financially restricting uh, my four kids. I practiced law for over 50 years. Uh, good portion of those years, I did title searches, closings, Oh, and I'm very, very, very familiar and served on the planning board. Uh, currently serve on the planning board's ex officio, uh, meaning I don't get a vote. So, uh, but attend those meetings. Uh, but I'm afraid we're just so... You know, my four kids have uh, either doctorates or MBAs. They're making good salaries. They already own a home, all four of them. Uh, but having helped the young person coming out of college or out of graduate school or high school wanting to build a home, uh, you know, even if dad owns the farm and wants to give you enough to build your house, you've now gone from minimum of 30,000 square feet to 65, an acre and a half, instead of an acre. Uh, it just looks like we're cost prohibiting our young folks and even older folks or retiring folks. Uh, as one of the speakers talked about, uh, I think we're unduly punishing too many people. Mr. Carter. Um. Between, sitting between these two guys, you don't leave a lot for anybody to say. But uh, <laughs> you were in you're in the legal profession. I was in the banking profession, and I have to admit, the larger you require a lot to be, the more it's going to cost to build the house. The more the bigger house, typically, you're going to want to put on it, which means you're going to limit the entry level affordable housing that a lot of people need. And we already know it's. I mean, all you have to do is look on Zillow or Realtor.com, and you can tell real fast that there aren't many homes in that entry-level price range in Alamance County. I've talked with Ms. Graves. I've talked with uh, Dwight. I've talked with Ken um, about lot sizes, about housing prices, and uh, I know what kind of a market we're dealing in right now. It's really tough. Um, I will, you know. There's some back and forth on this, too, because you talk about buffers between houses. I've been amazed. All you have to do is drive through McIntosh, and you got to realize you can stand up next to one house and spit and hit the one on the other side. I mean, a good, a good walking stick just about sometimes will hit your neighbor's house if you're standing there. Um, so it doesn't appear to be 
that that's a big issue for some home buyers. Um, but all this just leads me to believe we need to take a, a, a bigger look at what the competitive environment of our neighboring counties looks like. At what um, you know, take a take a hard look at this and, and get it get the planning department to take a really hard look at what's going on around us and let's see if we can't bring back some recommendations that break this down a little bit more, give us some different options as opposed to one size fits all. Mr. Lashley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here today and, and speaking. It's, it's very, very informative. Um, like Commissioner Turner said, I actually learned a lot of things <clears throat> that I currently hadn't thought about. Um, I don't know if I can add too much to what's already been said, but I can probably put this argument into context. I believe that this is one of these things where it's sort of like lights that fire of countywide zoning. I haven't really been in favor of countywide zoning. I've talked to a lot of people in the county about why we need countywide zoning. And the biggest argument that I hear is we need, everyone needs to be on the same page and everyone needs to be playing by the same rules. Also here, I want to be able to do with my land what I want to do with my land. Completely understand that argument. That argument also has another side. <laughs> if, you're, if you can do what you want with your land, so can your neighbor. And uh, it may not be what you want to have across the street from you. So I can understand it, and I also understand the mentality of where it comes from. It comes from the fact that people don't trust their government to do the right thing. That they know that they give the government an inch, the government will take a mile. I heard something today that the reason why we need to decrease this is because of to make affordable housing, and that is true. Um, What's causing housing to be unaffordable is your high inflation rate and your high interest rates. Or, and that's something that a lot of the young folks haven't had to deal with. Now, the older folks have understood if you were growing up in the 70s, you saw what happened. Um, what happened to interest rates. Um, and the gentleman was right. To take a piece of property and have to put a house on an acre and a half is going to cause less houses. But there lies the whole entire point. I mean, if you, no matter what side you're on, you have to have, what's your goal? You got to have a goal before you can start setting standards and setting rules. And, and the goal, from what I hear in the people in the county, you heard a speaker today say, we don't want the cluster homes that we see Put up in the city. And that's what people are weighing it on. What they see in the city, they don't want in the county. And there's a reason why. They don't want these cluster homes. And so you have to have your goal. What's your goal? Is your goal to keep the developers from building these small homes like, like uh, Commissioner Carter mentioned? Do you want those or do you not? That's basically what the argument is here. And, I, and that's why I go back to what I said before. Uh, that argument stipulates something that maybe all of us should look in the mirror and say, what do we want for our county? Do we want countywide zoning and why? Because this is one of the arguments for countywide zoning. Um, I heard someone say today that they thought that the planning board was trying to implement countywide zoning. Well, that could be true. It depends on what your goal is. We go back to what's the goal. So I just know that what I heard today about affecting the tax base, it's true. You will decrease the tax base if you decrease the lot size. I mean, excuse me, if you, if you increase the lot size, you will decrease the tax base. So um, like I said, I didn't think I'd be able to add too much to what the other two gentlemen had said, but I thought maybe I could put the argument in context so everyone can sort of like get an idea of where we need to go going forward. Uh, this is an extremely hard decision because you got to know what your goal is to know what the end result is going to be. 
So I thank everyone for their time. Ms. Thompson. Um, I know when I sat in here and watched the go through the zoning thing, I remember your gazebo couldn't be over seven foot tall in your backyard, and I thought, come on. But um, it it's just represents real serious change, and that can be very fearful when it's what you've got. Um, I, I've heard, I've been coming to the planning board meetings, and I've watched them go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, till they finally come to a compromise situation. And I saw somebody at a pizza place one night, and I was telling them that, you know, the whole audience with this situation is really, really smart. So you can't really talk over anybody because they're in the field and know exactly. The two engineer dudes, God, I'd love just to have coffee with you because of what you said, I thought, man, that's just drain pipes. I mean, because that's just not what I do, but that has to be done to build anywhere. Um, I'll tell you my concerns. Um, when we talk about affordable housing, I look at the overall picture. And in this day and time, affordable housing with some of the folks I work with is free. They can't afford nothing because that's just where they are. Getting up on their feet and trying to work and get to where you can. Um, I see the cost of housings that are, are so small and they're so expensive. And I don't know how people do it. I really don't. Because I told my husband, I said, look what we could sell our house for. He said, yeah, but we got to turn around and buy that because, and then we probably won't be able to afford but half the size of that. So you, it's just what it is. Um, my daughter's a teacher. She lives in an apartment in Jamestown. And I mean, she ain't loaded, <laughs> that's for sure. She's single. And, and she has to plan every penny. Um, affordable housing, I don't know when she would be able to get a house. And that's just what it is. It goes with the job because she is single. Um, I look at VinFast. I see where they're putting off their build in Chatham County to 2028. They closed one of their places in Durham. Um, I look at Toyota. It's just like the mother of all build. They've brought in $2 million to Randolph and Guilford County for STEM things in their school system. That, that kind of goes together. But eventually when VinFast comes in and, and Toyota's done, they too are going to need places to live. And they're right down there at Southern Elements. That's where I'm from. Um, building, I've noticed if I go out 49, 62 and take a left there at EM Holt, there are some beautiful homes with big lots. The more the lot, the more the house you can build. If you want to be smaller, it's always been thought to be closer to the city. Um, there is just all kind of different things that you look at. Um, we talk about tax base, you know, it's always going to be on the residential. Well, hopefully we're going to get more in our commercial tax base and look at that in a lot different way as well. Um, but I just um, want us to be, I, I have a question that I've heard and I'm just asking it because I've heard it, it was a trigger word for me, is agenda. Um, whenever I've come to the planning board meetings, I haven't really heard an agenda. It's been back and forth, feet this, yards this, long driveway. Some gentleman, I think he's one of the engineers that talked about, if you have your lot size and you have to build your house at the back, that's going to cost you a lot with that long driveway. And that, that makes sense, gravel or pavement. Either way, it's going to be a lot. Um, I look at, I'll tell you a story, and then I'll shut up. My mother lived on Bayfield Road out at Eli Whitney, and they bought a farm from Silas Guthrie, some of the best people in the world. Well, when him and his wife passed away, their family sold some land at the back of all that that goes up against Cane Creek. Now, <laughs> there was no school bus coming down that road because the only thing at the end of that road was a dairy farm. Well, whenever all the, they built small starter homes, all these children, the bus would come down what my mother thought was her road. Just imagine Billy Goat Gruff underneath the bridge, okay? And she just got livid because she thought that bus was going at least 90 miles an hour. And it, but it was just because it was going down the road. She even put up her own speed bumps, okay? And I believe your department sheriff and the DOT informed her that she can't do that, and she had to learn that. But now, they're some of the best neighbors she's got because they check on her and stuff like that. It's just that getting over that bridge of something new and different that we have to adjust to. And that can be really threatening and really scary. And that's when it comes time where we both have to all listen to each other. Um, the planning board has done their thing, and all you guys have come in here and done your thing. And um, I don't know if this discussion is finished or not because there's a big difference. And Bill, I'm with you on zoning. Um, I want that to be done so right that fits everything we can do to be fair to everybody in this county 
but we keep skirting around that. I mean, we've gone through the rock quarry, we've gone through other things, and that's in the middle of the country. Most people I know that live in the country want to live in the country. They don't want Huffman Mill Road near them. But if you live in the city, you love Huffman Mill Road because you're close to everything. It's just what that particular person wants and suits them in their livelihood. But affordable housing, what I'm hearing some of these presidential campaign people talk about as they got their magic wand, is um, a real serious problem, but promising all this money, you can give somebody money, but if they still can't afford it, they can't afford it. Don't set them up to fail. So um, I think there's just a lot of work to be done on this. I, I just, <coughs> that's just my opinion. But you can't keep putting it off to the next meeting because we've done this with several other things as well. Well, we can either have a motion to pass this ordinance or this modification or we can have no motion and take no action which would cause it to fail. Uh, I am not making a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that a potential path forward is that we instruct the planning department to look into this in consultation with the planning board. Come back um, at, I don't know, pick a time, 30 days, uh, with a more comprehensive look at this and some recommendations. Uh, to, for presentation to the planning to board and then eventually to come back to us. Would, would, would 60 was, days give you enough time? Well, my question would be on that. Is that specifically for additional changes to the subdivision ordinance or a hypothetical zoning draft or both? Well, the hypothetical zoning draft is going to take you longer than 30 days. I can promise you that. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to suggest what Commissioner Turner brought up to you before. Would it be prudent to look at what he was talking about, density versus, you know, certain areas? Um, I, I think that's a, that's a that's an approach that you could look at. Yeah. I'm not certain if it's going to be a, a solution, but I think it's probably something that maybe if you look at it, it may garner a solution. And, and I think what I had in mind, uh, and along with what Commissioner Lassie was talking about, is a more um, conceptual mm -hmm. idea than specific. That allows further discussion, and that that could drive the specific. Sure. Um, and I'd like to add to that: anytime you're on a committee that's as hot as a planning board committee, where there's real, real, real change that affects everybody that really is involved with their government and listens and comes here, um, that can uh, that's not easy. But I want to thank the folks on the planning board because it ain't like you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> or even $1,000 a year, um, or a dollar. Um, you put yourself out there to look at this and you listen to people in the community. And I also want to thank the folks in the audience that come because you know how much that's going to affect you and you bring a whole different perspective to this. It's just, just things that, that we aren't privy to. I mean, Craig Construction Law, absolutely, John. But, um, but I'm just saying, um, this is one of those real times where Maybe one group doesn't need to be up here and one group need to be out there. You all need to be in the same room and talk this together through and just kind of come to a compromise because it affects everybody. And uh, when you got people that sign up to volunteer and do big, big decision making in your government, you know, you, we just all need to listen to each other because at least they come in and they show up and they work hard. And I appreciate people coming here and showing up for their own business because it affects everybody and um, builders know uh, know and um, and we just need to really listen to each other we, we saw this in zoning for school system we saw people we would never see but you just have to care about your county because it is changing regardless it is changing and you just got to decide what it is that you want it to change into and that's very important because all of that will affect your schools it affects your first responder services you know, everybody, I say, everybody wants to live here. Well, that's going to make, you're going to need more EMS, you're going to need more law enforcement, you're going to need more fire. It just goes with it. So the more we grow, the more it costs us to grow. So don't forget that. Just clarify one thing. I'm not aware of any planning board member being paid anything. <laughs> that is correct. It hasn't been for a long time. I didn't want anybody to get the idea they were making money. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in closing, if I might say that, uh, again, thanks to the planning department who are using the tools that they have to address a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and their goals are stated in public, and that's what they're trying to do. Yep. Um, the, the last time we as a board took a long look at land use was um, down at Snow Camp. It was about, it was in, in reaction to a specific problem 
which was an industrial use in a particular part of the county. What we're talking about now is fundamentally different. We're mm -hmm. talking about land use pressures all over the county that are, are primarily residential. Uh, that affects not one part, but, but the entire county. And so the, the, the way we address that problem must be different than how we addressed uh, or how we, you know, we, we attempted to address uh, the industrial problem in the Southern Park County. This is different and the solutions must be different. Agreed. Are you making a motion? Uh, I, I don't know if, if, I guess, if I need to, but I would just I go back to my recommendation. Well, maybe it's more of a suggestion that we don't make a motion and ask the planning board to be more defined in what they're asking. Well, I would direct the efforts to the planning department in, in consultation with the planning board. So at this point, we have no motion, correct, board? Thank you. Planning board, we appreciate everything you have done and will continue to do. Uh, and I think we'll be glad or sorry to hear from you in the, in the future. <laughs> I'm looking at the chair, so when I say that. Okay. Oh, I'm going to give everybody about three or four minutes, if you would like to leave at this point, to do so. We're not taking a break, but I don't want everybody to... Good morning, commissioners. I am here for the third and possibly final installment of the uh, courthouse space renovation needs discussion. Um, we have three meetings, made uh, decisions about uh, the immediate courtroom space that we need in this room, and uh, last meeting made a decision on the long term needs that we have by uh, authorizing a new building. Uh, the part that we haven't addressed is the short-term needs that we have with our new judge starting January 1st. Please so, state what the uh, motion and vote was on our previous meeting. Your previous meeting, uh, the conclusion was to build a new courthouse addition, um, authorized $37 million, I believe, to construct that um, in the coming years. Thanks, sir. Um, so short-term needs start January 1st and we get a new judge. So the new judge is actually going to be in an existing courtroom in J.B. Allen. So we don't need place for him or her. Um, him. But we are displacing a, a small claims courtroom right now. So we need to find an additional space that can hold small claims court, relatively small courtroom. So I have three options for you. Um, and these options are really just shuffling people around. They're all, they sound a little convoluted. They're all somewhat similar, but they're just moving around existing departments and utilizing the space that we have to try and make something happen for in the short term until we can build the proper facility um, over the next couple of years. Um, so these are the three options, and I will go through each of them individually. Um, they all cost around three to five million dollars. Um, they're all repurposing existing buildings um, to find that space for the court. So the first proposal is to repurpose the first floor of this building, the county office building, um, to create a small claims courtroom and to make some room for the court system there. Um, we discussed this at a previous meeting as well, but this is a blueprint of the bottom floor of this building. There is a large room towards the back of the building that is suitable for a small claims courtroom. We can make that happen and also make some additional space downstairs uh, for other court needs. Um, and when I'm talking about other court needs, part of that is what do they need today? But that's primarily the court. The other part is what they need over the next couple of years. So as we build a new building, as we renovate the existing J.B. Allen building, there's going to be a need for people to shuffle around, to vacate their space, and we're gonna need some temporary space for people to go. Uh, just for a few months, till their space gets done, we'll put them back, get somebody else in there. We don't really know what all that's gonna look like, we just know we're gonna need some space to accommodate that. So that's um, one of the needs that would be served here. So the problem here is that this space is currently occupied by the tax department. 
So this requires um, us to acquire an additional building to house the tax department. There are some buildings for sale in Graham. We have some good ideas and some good options. Um, we don't have any of those ready to go. Um, so we'd be asking you guys to authorize us to begin renovation of the small claims courtroom downstairs to uh, identify and acquire an additional building for the tax department, um, try and get that done in six months or so. Um, that's proposal one. The benefits of that, it maintains the jury room in the J.B. Allen Courthouse. So we heard a lot about that in previous meetings. Is um, that three, four thousand dollar cost? Is that renovation for the current tax office, or is that purchase of a new building, renovation of that, and the tax office? It's both. The primary cost <coughs> driver there is acquiring a new building. Like we've got to buy a building, we've got to get that ready. Um, that's most of the cost. There is a cost associated with getting this uh, courtroom upfitted, and then we'll see what other kind of space renovations we have to do, not planning on a ton, but there's going to be something. Um, that's a relatively small amount of the cost. I think, you know, that's going to be less than $100,000 for the new courtroom for renovating uh, this building. So most of that cost is in acquiring a new building. And ideally, I, I, put, I put three to four million on here. I'd like to do it less for less. I think we can. There's just a lot of unknowns. So quite honestly, I'm setting expectations uh, <laughs> at a place we can exceed them. Um, so again, the benefits of that proposal keeps the jury room where it is. Um, it also, I think, if, if we can acquire the right building, would allow us to restore the drive-through service for the tax department. We had that during COVID when we were in the Medicap building temporarily. It was very popular. Um, this past Friday was the early deadline for taxes, and we had a lot of people in the lobby, people lined up out the door. If we could do some of that through a drive through it would be a big benefit for the citizens. That was very popular. The negatives of that proposal, of course, are that it does remove the tax department from this campus, from right downtown Graham campus. We're going to stay in Graham, um, but it's not going to be right here. Um, the, also, the other negative um, we don't know a whole lot about right now, but the clientele for small times courts and the clientele for the county office uses are different. Um, they're all going to be in that lobby, and the lobby will become, on some level, a small claims court waiting area. Uh, people will be coming in and out of there for small claims court. So to the extent that those uses uh, conflict, it's something we'll have to figure out how to work around. So that's proposal one. Proposal two. Um, is to put the new courtroom in the in the J.B. Allen building. So the current jury room that's in the J.B. Allen building, we can renovate that relatively inexpensively into a small claims courtroom um, and keep them there with all the other courtrooms. There's a, there's a benefit there. The downside, of course, is that the jury room currently uses that, and we'd have to find another spot for the jury room. The only spot we can make that happen is in the building across the street, which is called the County Annex now, but it's been previously called Elderly Service Building, the old Ag Building. Uh, it's called the County Annex now. We would essentially be getting county services out of that building. Again, they'd be using it primarily for the jury room, um, but also it would be a place for us to move people in and out of as J.B. Allen gets renovated and the new building is built. Um, the current uses of that building include planning and inspections, and we would need to find a new place for them to go. Um, the best place for them to go is the old elderly services building, which is on our northern campus right next to the current environmental health building. Um, it's long been a desire of us to get those services close together. Um, when you go get permits, you have to go to environmental health, you have to go to planning, you have to go to inspections. If those are in the same place, it's better for our customers. If they're in a place it's easy to get a truck and trailer through, it's better for our customers. So it would be great to have those together in that Just location. Just clarification, he's talking about Martin Street, which is across from the old Western Electric plant. That's right. Thank you. Um, um, and that's not just ready to walk right into, is it? No, it's not close. It's an existing building. It really needs a complete renovation uh, to have anybody in it. It was... We were in there last week. It was built in 1968. Haven't done a ton of work since then, um, so it needs quite a bit of work. Um, 
that would keep the tax department, this proposal would keep the tax department where they are, um, put the courts in the annex building, move planning inspections up to Martin Street. Um, proposed cost of that? Proposed cost of that is four to five million. Um, so if we need to walk through any more details, this is the blueprint for the J.B. Allen Courthouse. That's the jury room uh, indicating where the small claims courtroom would be. Um, this is the county annex for folks who aren't familiar with all these buildings downtown. Um, and this is the elderly services building on Martin Street. It's about 14,000 square feet. It's a big building, um, but it does need a, a overhaul to put people there. Um, so the benefits of that are it's more space for the courts. So that's an 11,000 square foot building. Uh, we would be able to give them the vast majority of that, if not all of that. Um, great place for the jury room. Also a bunch of additional offices as we're moving people around. Are you moving the veteran services out? We could. I don't think that's a determination we've made. It's a discussion we have to have later. We could leave them there. They don't take up a ton of space. They're kind of in a back corner. But we would have space for them at the other building if we wanted to do that. But I think that's a, another day. I haven't discussed that with them. So, um, Other benefits, it would create a single location for all of our permitting needs, as we discussed. Um, and it would maintain this building exclusively for county government functions. We wouldn't be sharing the county office building with the courts. Um, one negative, that building has the only meeting space in Graham where we can fit more than about 10 people, 12 people. Um, we would be losing that. It's, it's inconvenient, but that's where we are. So the third and final proposal um, is to do portions of that plan to renovate the, J the J.B. Allen jury room into a small courtroom and to move the jury room and the courts into the annex. Keep that part the same but that you could move planning inspections rather than up to elderly services, you would move planning inspections into this building downstairs where tax currently is. So this is just, we would move tax out into the new building. So this is just to say if the preference is to acquire a new building rather than fix elderly services, we can make that happen by moving people around, by moving tax out and just putting the folks in that building over here. Um, but a couple options as far as uh, doing that so that you don't have to um, spend the money to renovate the elderly services building. That's a bigger price tag. It's four to five million um, to get that building ready. It's a big building that needs renovation. So if we don't want to have that price tag, we can acquire a building, um, put tax in it, but still keep planning inspections here. Um, that Let has me advantage. Show you down there. Sure. The current. Um Elderly service, well, current elderly service building or the street on Martin Street, rather. Uh, yeah, this, I know the answer to this. The current condition of that building, and if we do not renovate it, what's the other option? The other option is to tear it down. I think those are the only two options. It's been vacant for a few years. Um, it could stay there for another year or two, but that's about it. Um, we can't have empty buildings sitting for long. Um, we haven't invested in the roof and the HVAC and the things you need to keep that building going. So either you're putting that money in and renovating it, or it's time to give up on that building and, and tear it down. So we either tear it down or we renovate it. Um, large building, is it structurally sound? Yeah, it is. Uh, um, we haven't done a formal engineering study on it. I have walked around there with some, some general contractors and say, give me your opinions and your costs to get these cost estimates. Everything we can tell now is it's structurally fine. It just needs a new roof. It's had some leaking. It has some mold now. Um, the HVAC has not been kept up. The electrical is original in 1968. Probably not where we need to be to put a new department in there. So I think we're pretty much gutting it and, and filling it back in, but structurally, it's it's a uh, steel reinforced concrete it's a good building and i assume it's uh, much cheaper to use a building that needs renovation than building tearing it down and starting a new building uh, yeah absolutely we could not build anything in the market today uh in the price ranges we're talking about it's it's going to be double double that number to build anything <coughs> and what is the square footage we would gain again 
that one's 14,000 square feet. So it's a big building. Uh, we could fit a number of things in there. One reason we haven't discussed veteran services because if you're taking that much space, we don't need all that for planning inspections. So we've got some options to work through what goes in there. We're trying to make a single, a one-stop permitting place. What does that look like? It's just going to take a little planning to figure out the best use of that building. Is this where ACT used to be? Yes, ACT okay, used to be in the basement. Is this where also the, um, the adult daycare center was? Yes, this is where Friendship okay. was. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought community services, I remember, yep. they were all there, and, um, and it didn't need renovating when they were there. Oh, uh, I... Because they were there for a long time until they got the $2.8 million building donated. They were. For them and open house, all that stuff by Mr. Petrie. I would believe that it did need renovation at that time, but we didn't do it. Right. Um, Priorities. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, just curious. I thought that was the same one. Yeah. We, okay. Right. Um, so those are the options. Um, happy to talk through the implications of, of any of these, but the price tags are similar um, between 3 and $5 million. It's really just where is the court best situated? Where is the best place to put the county services that we're displacing? What if you were to relocate the tax office to the annex, the annex operation to the Martin Street, and then modify the court space downstairs? Is that a possibility? Is there enough space over there for that? Among the myriad of options I've looked at, I don't know that we've thought about putting the tax office over there. It's possible. Not 100% sure right now that it's big enough, but yeah, we could certainly. Then we wouldn't be buying another building. Sure. We'd have a building right over there, tax office there. Modify for court space downstairs. Move the people over there out to Market Street. Yeah, it's cer certainly an option. What's the cost for demolishing the current building? We don't have that number. Haven't haven't gotten that far. It's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be cheap. And then we have a vacant lot and nothing, and lose again. How much square footage? Yeah, fourteen thousand. Yeah. Uh, it's it would be a shame to give up that level of square footage. It's a good building. It just needs. To yeah. I served in that building. I was on the uh, mental health board and was chairman of that board. Then the uh, Governor Hunt demolished mental, uh, county mental health departments and outsourced it. Uh, then I was also on the active board in that building. I've been in that building for years. Uh, it does need renovation, but it's a wonderful building and great location. Uh, if we put planning, inspections, environmental uh, and GIS and all four in that building, then the developers who were here earlier and the realtors and so forth could go to one single spot and get all the permits, have all the hearings, have everything in one spot. But it's going to cost us $4 million to do it. Yeah. Um, so all of this rearranging, because that's you're moving here to there to there to there is for one is for the new judge position because we got to have that courtroom correct okay are you is when you, i see the tax i mean there's so many plans are the three courtrooms in this and that building right there are they staying courtrooms yes i mean when we i think we've got a lot of work to do to figure out what we do when the new building is done but until that they need all of that space, so yes. Now I'm asking once that build is done, because we've talked about if you move those three over there, you're only getting one new courtroom for 37 so, million. So we're in negotiations. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what we're going to be able to move and what we can move out of this building. Um, I don't think we've decided that yet. You're creating a lot of new capacity over there, and you'll be able to get out of some things, but not everything. You know, we're not building the $99 million one that's going to fit everything in there. Brian, it's gone. <coughs> it's down to its fourth bid. Right. And um, it, this has got confusion right all over it for people having to go find something else. You talk about drive-through Medicap building. It's... I, I don't want to spend, it don't matter, I'm only one of five, 
I don't see spending this kind of money if it's not going to stay that way, if it's a quick fix. Because you're talking about the other building up there on Martin Avenue. I was in Family Justice Center. They redid that whole thing. It was a green building. We couldn't have over, I can't even tell you what they told us about bathroom stuff because it was green. It was amazing. And it's a well-kept building. They have done nothing. At one time, the elderly building was going to be the diversion center. That was part of Stepping Up Initiative, and I was on that. And I think it was like me and eight to redo the whole thing there. And then we end up going way over there in Burlington. So it just seems like we're just dropping money to fix one problem, and we're still not fixing the whole problem. So I mean, I'm just thinking, like I asked last time, is there just this, this money that I don't know about that we've just got whenever I see, I mean, I, <laughs> And it's just petty, but our teacher's supplement had to be frozen to last year's amount. You know, I, that, that's something. That makes, that's a big deal. We give incentives to corporations. It's all about giving you a reason to be here in Alamance County and make a profit, make a living, and employ our people. And this is just, uh, I just feel like we're jumping on a monopoly board to find up different things, and we're going to end up getting right back where we started, but we've spent a lot of money. That's just what it looks like to me, and I can be totally wrong, but I'm looking through on the outside looking in. So I will say that whatever changes we would make in accordance for this to fix these short-term needs are permanent, right? We're not going to move planning inspections over to elderly services, move them back in two years. Um, that building would stay with the courts, and it would stay with the courts forever. Um, it is a little moving around. There How are many times it's better than service office moved? I don't know the answer to that. More than once or twice. Yeah. I'm just curious. Consistency to know where you are is so important. Especially yeah. to, they got to have easy accessibility. You never know what's coming there. I'm just asking. Yeah. Well, if you were finished. I'm done. If you were to follow the routine that I went through where we moved taxes over to the annex bill, that means you don't have to buy another building, which was, I think, about a million eight. Is that right? Yep. So that cuts that from three to four down to around two, two and a half. So we need to buy a new building, or fix, buy or fix a new building. So that's either going to be uh, elderly services building or it's going to be a new location in Graham. How much modification would we need? And I know you haven't thought about that, so you'd have to take a look at it. But that, that that's a building we own. Martin Street's a building we own. Downstairs, we own. Yes. No new buildings. Got to save us some money. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah. you're including Gotta Martin Street. Remodeling. That The 4 to $5 million on the elderly services building at Martin Street, that is primarily fixing that building. Okay. So I don't think we're going to get out of that building for less than four, but four now, and a that half. Would not, that would not modify the space downstairs from the, from the tax department to court use, would it? Would it? I'm not sure which plan you're on now. Um, <laughs> so, if we don't have to fix, the, we don't have to put courts downstairs. We can put courts in the annex building and move those folks up to the Martin Street building. Um, the, what you mentioned a minute ago was, what if we move tax over there? If we move tax over there, then you would, of course, have to renovate downstairs for the courts. How much space do we do we gain by converting the annex to a court space? from a future use perspective versus having the space downstairs where we already have court space? Yeah, quite a bit. Um, so this building here, this is the first floor of this building. You're creating that court space, and then we can make some room available, uh, moving tax out of here. It's not going to be 11,000 square feet. And that's what that building is. So the annex building, we can make 11,000 square feet and just give that it to give the courts. courts. More space than downstairs. It would, yes. Taxes are okay where they are. They have every, all the space they need. They do. You've heard me say in the past, we are out of space in this building. We're still out of space in this building, but any of these moves would help alleviate that a little bit and help get us through towards a point where, um, yeah, we can get the courts out of some of this space when we b get the new building completed. So the old plan, Pam, the original plans, uh, was to build a new building and they get all the way out of here and go all the way into that new building. 
the court system. We're not building that building anymore. Um, they're, you know, we're not, not building the big one size fits all. Everything can go in there. So there's going to have to be uh, some discussions about what they need to keep in this building and what we can have back um, for county purposes. So we don't know yet. I'm going to make a motion that we adopt proposal number two, that is uh, renovating <coughs> the current jury lounge to provide a hallway down for jurors and a smaller courtroom. The annex building, former ag building, call it whatever you like, for the jury lounge currently, and then renovating the Martin Street, call it whatever you like, current building, because we're going to have, what, a million bucks? A million bucks to tear that building down, and then you have zero, and we're picking up a lot <coughs> of county spacing on Martin Street and putting several departments with a one-stop shop to obtain permits and for builders, for realtors, for homeowners, uh, for people in commercial buildings. But they go to one location as opposed to driving all over the county to do everything. I know it's going to cost four, four and a half million. We're not having to buy a new building. We are having to renovate a current building that we own and picking up a lot of space and one stop for construction and what, that sort of thing. So proposal number two is my motion. John, did you say you're not renovating another building like over We're there on Martin Avenue? Yeah, we are renovating okay. that building. That's okay. part of that cost. Okay. But we're picking up a lot of space. <coughs> Do I have a second? I'll second. Motion and a second. Mr. Yeah, yes. I, I thank you. Um, we've got a number of issues that we're trying to solve at the same time. Yeah. Um, all of it has to do with the fact that we've outgrown the space <coughs> for county government to perform its functions that it needs to perform, and that is as of January 1st. Um, we have a building that the county owns on county property that we must do something with, we either must fix it or tear it down. It cannot continue in its current state. Correct. Um, it's 14,000 square feet, which is the biggest square footage I've heard on the table. Yeah. Um, and once we're done, what we have essentially is a new building. I mean, the structure is, is sound, everything in it would be new, as opposed to buying some another building in Graham that, uh, maybe a bank, that may not that, that would that would be newer than 1968, but all of its internal services would be as old as 30 years. Right. So that to me makes sense. We're using the buildings that we have, and it does create, as the chairman said, a one-stop <laughs> shop area for permitting in the county. Yeah. Uh, you could even perhaps move move environmental services into that building as well, which would create everything in one place for for contractors, which would be helpful. Um, so that, and also is. You talk about I don't know I don't think we have to decide at this moment who to put in. Right, correct. We don't need I mean, we just need to know whether issue. we want to fix it. Right. Yeah. Um, it, planning and inspections, you mentioned them as being a, a if we go with the one stop shop option, planning yeah. and inspections must go in there. Right. How are they currently fitting into the spaces that they have now in the annex? Not well, but <laughs> they're there. So if you've ever been over there, there's a, you go in to the right, there's a small counter where they've got kind of three teller windows, which they need to have to take permits. Um, those, that part's okay. They really don't have space in the back. Um, right now our inspectors um, work in the field the vast majority of time. They work in the field all the time now because we don't have anywhere for them to sit. So to the extent that they need to come in and do paperwork, they need to respond to some of the inspections, we don't have a spot for them to do that. So um, they do that in their trucks, they make something work. But this would give us a better spot. Uh, for permitting, um, planning inspections would be set for a long time. Um, yeah, creating that one-stop shop. If we don't put all of environmental health in there, we can at least create a one, 
location where people can get all their permits even if all the office workers aren't there we can make sure that there's one desk one central location for the customers so lots of opportunities there okay so it makes sense that we do that and frankly a decision probably that we should have made a while ago it's just that now that the space needs are are immediate it's a reason to move on That's yeah. yeah so Attorney might yeah. also point out that once planning and inspections leaves the, this current building it picks up more space for the court system and the clerk's office. I'm sorry. The what now? The what? what? The old ag building, you were vacating uh, planning and inspections. So it'll pick up more space for either the court system, the sheriff's department is uh, mostly the basement area of that building currently. Is that correct? So the sheriff's department is on the left side of that building and the basement. Um, our plan has been for the sheriff's department to go to the renovated Board of Elections building, the old Board of Elections building, when that's available. Um, so the, in time, the majority of that building, if not all of that 11,000 square feet, could be for court purposes. Yeah. And so, that's, again, temporary until we build the new three-story structure. Mr. Turner, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, the sheriff's raising his hand. Mr. Johnson has a question. Thank you, Thomas. I think, you know, we've got to look at the total picture here. And I also think, and this is just me, if we made, the ta if we moved the tax office over to the mm -hmm. annex, that means we don't have to have security there, which means more people. In the long run, it's going to call. And... Uh, we have security here already with one courtroom. And if we take the tax office, we'll have, we'll have the second courtroom until the things get done. Mr. Chair, if I don't, I'm not trying to pick an argument, but a lot of cash goes into the tax department. I think we are going to have to provide some security. Well, you're talking about one man versus two deputies in the courtroom, one outside for security. We don't have a scanner for that building. We don't have a scanner for that building. And no scanner? Oh, you're going to have to get a, get a scanner, clearly. I'm just saying the manpower and the scanner is going to cost. You know, yeah. And it's really the cheaper route right now, I think, until we get the courthouse addition built. All right. I think in your cost proposal number two, we talked about scanner and areas for clearance. Is that included in your... So option number two here uh, has the courtroom remaining in the J.B. Allen building. So the small claims court is remaining there. So their security needs are taken care of. The only folks that are moving over to the annex is the jury lounge area. And so I don't have the ongoing cost built into that. This is the renovation <coughs> cost. So to the extent you need uh, ongoing security for just the jury lounge, that's a separate consideration. And if I may continue with it, and that's where I was moving to, but one other thought, um, I have the opinion that we ought to renovate elderly services. That is not a building that is set up nicely for tax. Correct. Um, so does it doesn't make sense to move tax into there. Question whether it makes sense to move tax somewhere else. I think we can put off for the moment. Um, but it, if tax doesn't move there, we don't, buy, I don't, we don't have to buy another building tax stays where they are. Um, at least in the short term, means there's no space for a courtroom there. Correct. Can you go to the picture that shows the JBL? All right, when we talked about jury before, in that there are two functions that room serves currently. Well, there are more than two, but related to the jury, there are two functions. One is indoctrination. Everybody comes in, get indoctrination on what it means to be a juror. Then the jurors are impaneled. Once they're impaneled, that, Brian, can you highlight that little rectangle on the bottom side of the jury? That's the jury deliberation room, which is where they stay. One, a number of concerns that Sean Boone had at our last meeting was that if you, if you turn the jury room, the jury assembly room into a courtroom, you don't provide ingress and egress for jurors separate from the court, separate from juror, from uh, litigants, from the judge. That's a problem. He also indicated that there were problems with restrooms in the jury deliberation room and that if the jury didn't have access to that jury room, they would not be able to, um, uh, to, to 
have lunch, to loiter at when court's not in session. Um, and so there, was, there, was some, there should be some room, he thought, that they could have outside the jury deliberation room where they can make phone calls and do the administrative work of their day. Um, I, what, we ha what we have done in this proposal, too, I know you've, you've had some conversations with the court folks, is to turn that room that's labeled jury into two rooms, one that would allow small claims, one that would allow for some meeting space, ingress and egress, access to the restrooms there, and also the vending machines so that the jury in dock would be done across the street at Annex. Once jury is impaneled, they would still be in that space, uh, although it would be a smaller space. And that that is a, a, a compromise, if you will, that works in the short term while we move to a bigger solution. Correct. So you've, you've blown my, through my defenses to try to not get into the details here. It's okay. Uh, so this is a discussion. Uh, a layout we've been discussing with Judge Overby in the court system about what this could look like. You'll see it has a small claims courtroom, but it also has a separate hallway um, and a, an area there where the jury could go out of their jury room, their deliberation room and back, but still have a small area for gathering uh, for whatever purposes. Make phone calls, have a snack, whatever that need is. Um, it, the final layout will not be exactly like this, but this is the concept of what we think we could do there to accomplish both of those needs and, as you said, make a compromise position. And so I don't think you need security in the annex because the jury, once it paneled, is inside of J.B. Allen. Uh, the court space that we're talking about using for the annex, if planning inspection should move out, is more office space. It's not, I think we've determined a courtroom over there just doesn't make sense. Correct. But office space for your ancillary services, for the juvenile counselors, for guardian ad litem that had one time we talked about putting in a larger building for the courts could go there and be close to, uh, close to JBL. Correct. While we're building the courthouse, it's flex space. It allows you to move people in and out as their space is getting renovated, and that's valuable. Um, I don't imagine at this point we would put a courtroom in there. Um, it's it's possible, but it just doesn't work well. And, and as the sheriff said, you need additional security. So I don't think that's what we're talking about. It's more the other uses, getting them, uh, using that as flex space as we build and renovate the J.B. Allen complex. Um, after that, there's some av available space. You have a lot of other court folks in here. All the new, all the court folks that want to be in the new courtroom, courthouse, they're not all going to fit in there. So um, this allows some additional space for whatever those court growth needs are. They can fit them in that building. And we haven't really talked about today that $10 million of the, of the $37 million is for JBL and renovation. Right. So once the addition is complete, I would imagine this would look different. Um, and so this is not a great option. The others aren't great options for courts. I mean, for the rest of county government, I think it is. But for courts, there's not a great option. I think this is the best bad option. And it's incorporated with option two, which is what the chairman moved. Correct. Mr. Carter, you indicated you want to be. I've lost where I was now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the sheriff had a comment, and I've got some of the same concerns about security. Uh, we're having a hard enough time getting people to serve in the sheriff's office anyway. I mean, hopefully, hopefully we, we see the, some light at the end of the tunnel on that. We may be seeing that turn around. But uh, I, anything that stresses that department anymore is not, not, not what I would consider to be an acceptable solution. But You've got a motion on the table, and you've got a second. My 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 comment before was, you know, we've got a building over here that could be the tax office, court space downstairs is already using security, and uh, move people that are in what would become the tax office out to the Martin Street facility, which is part of that plan in. Uh, uh, I just think that's a better option, but you got a motion and a second. So. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, there's, there's really no good, there's really no good options here. 
I mean, I like the three that you proposed. <laughs> They're really not, I mean, not what I would think would be what I would come up with. Um, I think your proposal, too, is doable. Uh, you get more square footage. Uh, but, you know, Commissioner Carter, you were thinking down the line I was. Um, not having to buy the new building, right? Getting the tax folks in that same, the same concourse. That's a huge space. We went up, went through it the other day, and it's. The and, but we don't have, you know. I think what would do with I mean, the building being one point eight, uh, a PNC building, um, would knock that three to four million dollars in half. Right. So, you know, that's it. Now. It's just, this is a, this is very difficult. But we don't have the, the numbers on that particular solution. But I can understand why you guys like numbers. Well, I hate to push it down another another meeting, but maybe we could take a look at that. Take a look at the, the cost of that option. It's Saving that that money to buy that other building and using the uh, using the uh, annex instead. It's for that. Mr. Thompson. I'm just going to say it. I feel like we are band-aiding a problem that we are spending money here, there, everywhere, and it's still not going to really solve our problems for the future. And so, um, I, you know how I feel about this. I, I just We're moving everything. Um, people don't know where they're going. You're going to have to market, advertise to do all that. It's just a lot that goes with this just from putting up new sheetrock. And um, that's just... Um, like that Paul and Peter thing, I feel like we're taking from one to give to the other one. And I know you guys are in the courtrooms, and, and I know you know this, what you need. I, I just don't feel like our needs are going to be really met for future. You're always saying, Steve, how we're growing. Are we growing in crime? Are we growing in people? We're growing in school population? We're growing in everything, which affects everything, not just a courthouse. Um, it's just... Um, I just, uh, I just look at what we just went through with our taxes, and here's more extra money. I know you got to spend money to do things. That's what that's part of government, but um, there's just so much uncertainty. I, I just, um, I just think about that building over there for the elderly. If it was good enough for all those folks being there for that long, then all of a sudden it's not. Um, it's just a priority thing. When we parks and recreation, we've talked about kids' seasons and things like that. We just seem to have money for some things, but we don't seem to have money for others. That, to me, they're all important. There's not one department in this county that's more important than the other because it's the lives of our citizens. So um, I know I don't have a I don't have a dog in this fight when it comes to having any kind of anything, but I just can't sit. That's four to five million dollars, just like that, and we're still we we sure do rearrange and remodel. Mr. Chairman, well, if you take the first option and you rearrange it without having to buy the PNC building that PNC. saves us oh. PNB or whatever it is um, that, that saves us about a million eight. Well you're talking about how important it is to have a vault or some kind of security with all the money because John that is that is big bucks over there and um, you just have to be safe with that I, I, I do just can't risk it. I mean you see all the time, smash and grab. I mean, people are nuts now. They go in and steal anything. And, um, I, you know, you got two guys or two girls or both downstairs. That's a security for them. That's a front line for them. And they have a vault to put that money in. And they're also on site. I really don't want the tax department way across town not being on site. Or well, it would just I, be across the street. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may ask... Uh, Mr. Commissioner Carter, question in one second. I, I did go to the elderly services building last week, and it's unusable. Oh, I know. It's not usable. It wasn't then either. It was probably a dump for a yeah. long time. So we either got to tear it down or we got to fix it. Um, when you're talking about you're talking about moving the tax department to the annex, right? Where do the people in the annex go? Out the, the Martin Street. Oh, so you're. Okay. I'm still talking about using the Martin Street facility. Yeah. Well, just talking about taking these folks to Martin Street, tax department over there, and turning the downstairs space into court space. How, Part of the other piece of that equation is right now we've got courtroom, a courtroom in the historic courtroom. We've got a courtroom downstairs. And we've got a court. We've got courtrooms over at J.B. Allen. 
we're looking at adding a fourth building into court space. Our citizens have got to come to town and figure out where they're going to wind up when they get called to go to court. And we have four different, we're looking at taking it from three to four buildings as it is. If we keep the court space downstairs, then we've still got just three locations that we've got court. The, the, the problem is, and what created this conversation is the need to have a court on January 1st. How long is it going to take to renovate elderly services? Um, at least a year, probably a year. So you can't move planning out of annex until a year, so you can't move tax into the annex for a year, and you create no hole for a courtroom. So it doesn't it doesn't work for for the short term yeah. solution. But to clarify, we can use across the street as a jury lounge within the three or four months that we've got. Correct. The jury lounge would essentially be in the one big conference room there, so right. the planning inspections isn't isn't in that space right now. So option two, although we won't have move planning and inspections that quickly, will work short term, long term, and then we've got the three story addition to JB Allen that will ultimately resolve our immediate needs. Correct. I agree with uh, Judge. Um, the judge earlier talked about that may not be enough, but at least <clears throat> it's what we need for the immediate future right. uh, with the three-story addition. And it makes more space for the clerk of court, uh, even temporarily once we move, that is, in a year, planning and inspections gives more space to the clerk, although it's again temporary, until we can move it into the addition for the J.B. Allen. We, we've got to do something now. We don't have a luxury of time. Uh, and this option number two solves the immediate problem, and it does it in segments, i.e. moving planning and inspections to Martin Street within roughly 12 months, uh, and giving the clerk and the court system more space as they move out. Um, I just don't see we have, that we have our agreement, Mr. Turner. I don't think we have a lot of options. I got an option for you. Oh. But I don't want to beat a dead horse because I've said this a half a dozen times. If you want to free up some court space in the short term, how about having night court in the short term? In the short term. That would, that would solve all your problems. I wish the sheriff was here because I know it's going to take added security to do that at night. But you don't have to buy a new building. You don't have to switch this person to that place and this place to that person. You can just do it in the short term. And guess what? When the courthouse annex got built, you can stop. I've said it too many times. I've just said it too many times. That is a solution to this problem. But no one wants to take a good hard look at it and maybe do the numbers. Here's the sheriff right now. Uh, <laughs> no, excuse me, but I'm it's your fault. Oh, no. no, we were just talking about you when you stepped down the room. Uh, I, I was mentioning that, yeah, I've said this before, and I'll say it one last time. I won't say it again. If we want to solve this courtroom problem in the short term before we get the annex built, Let's have night court in the short term. I'm not saying forever. I'm just saying to get until we get that building built, and then we can sh we can shut it off because we'll have the space. And I know that we had talked about the security. <laughs> oh, no, that, would, that would take some take some time, maybe some added manpower. But that's my, that's my. I won't say it again. Got it. Yes, sure. In the long run, how much money will, will it save by doing it? It'll save you three point. It'll save you three four million dollars. Just over how much it costs to, to, to put the uh, right. the added people in, and I know that the court system, they would have to uh, juggle their schedules a bit, and uh, I know night court's not really something that, you know, uh, from here, because uh, uh, I have experience with night court living in New York, because they have two sessions, right. and they get let you choose. 
which one would you rather have, yeah. night or day? And most working folks choose the night time so they don't miss work. We'll cover it, but then you've got to have DAs, you've got to have clerks. Oh, I understand. You know. But we're talking about a short-term solution. We're not talking about from now on. Let Just me ask this solution. question. How many personnel are assigned Monday through Friday from the Sheriff's Department alone Monday through Friday for the court system? Court Give me system. a number. 20. 20, son. 20 some, all right. We aren't going to add additional judges, but how many uh, personnel for the judges are going to have to spend overtime? It's so, going to be a minimum of what your uh, one spirit court, two district court. Are you uh, saying if we went to night court? If you went to night court. So I think trying to get everybody on board with that, and the sheriff is correct, you have the DA's office, the public defender's office, the clerk, the judges, and the, the bailiffs, um, all to buy into that and agree to it first. But, you know, right now we have four district court judges. We're adding <coughs> in January, but we also have magistrate judges and clerks that run court every single day of the week. I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to help your cause. Uh, uh, and how many more clerk personnel are going to have to spend another pick night court? You say it's limited to five hours. How many people are the clerk's office are we talking we, about? We, we don't have the staffing to run day court right now. I, I understand that. Give me a number. 20, 30? Um, I have no idea what that number would be, depending on the kind of court that we would hold. Yeah, would it's going to be a, a large court. number. My point being, Bill, great idea. Just don't have the staff. You don't have the staff, you don't have the personnel, you don't have the money for all the overtime or extra personnel or judges. Can I, can I add one thing really Absolutely. quick? Absolutely. Um, I appreciate everyone trying to solve this solution. I, I really do appreciate <coughs> the commissioners and the county management and the county government trying to find a solution to this. The problem we have right now is January 1st, mm -hmm. we have another judge. Right now we have eight courtrooms and we have eight judicial officials who run those courts every single day. So when we add one more, we don't have space. And that would usually come down to small claims, which is statutorily mandated within a certain amount of time that they have to have their hearings. Right now we know they're going to use this room because they've run out of space in our other courtrooms uh, beginning this week. And so what I don't want to see happen is January 1st, we have to shut courts down because we don't have the space. Um, and that's not what I want to happen at all. I'm, I'm very, very um, pleased that we are trying to solve problems. You know, I don't disagree with you, Commissioner Nat Lashley, that night court would solve it, but there's so many moving pieces, as there is to everything to get. We don't have a state mandate for that right now. We don't have flexible time with different um, offices and, and, and people to do that. We do have a shortage in the clerk's office right now. Um, and I think that's a great solution. However, I just don't know that we can get it done by January 1st. I understand. And so for January 1st, what are we looking at? Um, and I appreciate everybody taking the time to look through these proposals. I will say the proposal for using the J.B. Allen, the jury assembly room, is it's too small. And so that's one of the problems we have. Um, I agree with Commissioner Thompson that we're band-aiding and that, you know, we need to look to the future. Where are we going to be with the J.B. Allen renovation? We're adding four courtrooms. We're still going to be in two buildings. We will still always be in this building and the J.B. Allen. Maybe we'll give up the historic for you guys to, to have your meetings in that building. Um, but we're still always going to have two buildings. But adding a fourth building to run jurors back and forth, you know, with clerk personnel without a scanner, without security in there, I just want you to think about that. And I understand the tax department needs security 100%. They need a vault, they need security. And so there's a lot of, of moving pieces here, um, but we have to think about what those capacities for courtrooms are. You know, I pulled the dockets for small claims and we're upwards of anywhere from 15 to 28 people on a docket. Well, there's two sides to every case. So 15 people, you have 30 people that are gonna show up before attorneys. If you have 28, you're at 56. And if our capacity is 48, we've got people out in the hallways um, with jurors, with d um, defendants and other court personnel staff. And so it's just a really take time to really think about, and I know there's so, it's like a big bad algebra problem, right? And this variable here and this variable here, <laughs> and you know this variable has this cost associated with it. 
But January 1st, I don't want to have to be the one to say to people, we have to shut court down because we don't have a space to hold court. And so where is that court space going to come from? And also that it's the right capacity to hold all the people that's needed. So I appreciate your hard work, and I appreciate the fact that you're trying to solve problems. You know, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure, and I hate to say this, but I'm not sure in the three proposals we have that we've got an absolutely perfect solution at all. Well, I clearly think there is no perfect short-term solution. Solution. <laughs> uh, this is, as Ms. Thompson indicated, putting a Band-Aid on to get us to the expansion of the J.B. Allen Courthouse. And but we have Band-Aids. We don't have <laughs> miracles. And we've got to do something, as the judge just pointed out, with option number two, we will not complete Martin Street by then, but you will have the ability, ability to have the renovation of the current jury lounge and moving the jury lounge across the street for a temporary. That can be done by January 1, can it not? Yes. All right. So that's a solution that works temporarily. Um, Madam Clerk, I hate to bring this up again. I know I've practiced law forever uh, compared to most people in this room. Uh, and small claims court always segmented 15-minute allotments, and you had an assigned time, so you never had large groups of people waiting around in the hallway as uh, Judge Overby just talked about. If we go back to segmenting 15-minute slots to small claims court, that we won't have groups of people, large groups of people sitting around waiting all morning or all afternoon. So we have two dockets, a morning docket and an afternoon docket. Um, and the reason that we went away from the time segments was because if the first case is a continuance, then you're waiting 15 minutes before the parties to the second case show up. So we needed to be able to move faster through those dockets and allow the magistrates to have more flexibility about what cases they called instead of following a one and then two and then three approach. We needed magistrates to be able to come in and say, okay, this case is on for a continuance. Next case, attorney, you're here for that case. Let's get the attorney out of court. Okay, next case, who's not? here oh that's a dismissal next case and do all of that relatively quickly um, without waiting those time slots so we found it to be more efficient um, I understand I understand what you're you're pointing out though about the time segments but we found that the open docket is more efficient allows the magistrate to get their work done quicker we can get those judgments entered and then be ready for the afternoon docket I think that's a wonderful idea when we have more court space um, but I think in the interim, we're just, we're really crunched with, with spacing. Uh, thank goodness I'm not the clerk of court, and I don't make that decision, and I'm not a judge, so I don't have to make those decisions. Uh, they're tough decisions on your part, but uh, at least we could look at going back and not having the large groups of people that Judge Overby was talking about. Uh, at least it's an option, not trying to recreate the wheel, trying to solve a temporary problem until we can move into an additional building or an expansion of the existing J.B. Allen Courthouse. Well, if we go back to proposal number three, that answers the problem for security for the tax office, put them in a building with a vault, security. Repurpose the county annex. But we're or. spreading out. Now, we're already in downtown ground. <laughs> we're on Martin Street. The health department is even further down the street. And now you're going to buy a new building well, south of the interstate. That wasn't my like first plan idea. But, I mean, like, like we've said, there's not a perfect solution in any one of the three. Yeah. And I think the sheriff is going to have to provide security 
to the tax department. As Ms. Thompson pointed out, uh, there's not less crime today, there's more crime. Thank goodness in Alamance County, that's not the prevailing case because we have a really good sheriff. But he's going to have to provide, provide security for the tax department if we move him down south of the interstate. Well, this uh, <laughs> building that you're going to acquire for the tax is the PNC building. It's one of, it's one of the options. Thing. Well, it's an option, and the more we talk about it, the higher the price is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, if it's a building that you're acquiring that's a bank, there are certain security measures that are already in place that you could place those people in that are going to be acting as if they are bank employees. So, you know, it, it would be, and you're going to repurpose the county annex anyway. Um, Brian, I'm assuming that both Proposal 1 and Proposal 2 the three to four million dollars includes the price of the building. You're basically the price of the building, 1.8. I bet we could probably try to get it a little cheaper. I guess if we. Uh... So both of these numbers, all of these numbers include the cost and renovation of the of the building, the physical space. Yeah. If I was the property owner and I, somebody just announced the building is on the lot for purchase, heaven help us. <laughs> and like Judge Overby says, this has to be done by January 1st. So all three of these proposals didn't meet that deadline. <laughs> For, we can like do two, our best. Can yeah. I ask, can I ask? Two can't meet the deadline, can it? Because that's repurposing the elderly right. services. No, number no, two will. Yeah, two will because we're turning the downstairs uh, sure. annex building across the street into a lounge only temporarily yeah we're not moving anybody so planning inspections can share that space until their building is done it's okay it's just not an ideal long-term solution and you said about a hundred thousand yeah what's that what's that about well it buys creating a small claims courtroom. It depends where you put it, but you've got to build the bench, you've got to put the pews in, you've got to build the walls, you've got to do the wiring. It just builds a small claims courtroom for the most part. It's probably a little cheaper than that, but we're also trying to do it really quickly. Quickly can get you in trouble. Okay, we have a motion and a second uh, on proposal number two. Uh, let's either vote it up or down. Um, Quick question, Ms. Jim, uh, if I may. Um, the funding for any of these proposals, where would that come from? So we have enough funding in capital reserves right now. And, and you'll remember at the last <laughs> meeting, you also... Um, use some ARPA funds uh, to offset things that we'd already spent. So you created uh, some additional funding that's available for this project in the ARPA project funding last week. So um, that's an option. We also have capital reserves available. It's cash. It's cash, yes. What would we do without that magical capital reserves and that fairy godmother who flies over dropping money too? Boy, when little Miss ARPA goes out of town, that's going to be interesting. We're going to find it somewhere, and I know where we'll find it. But that capital reserves, we just keep going right to it. I guess that's what it's for, huh? That's, that's what yeah. it's for. Yeah, yes. Okay, we have motion and second. All in favor of motion option number two, motion number two, signify by saying aye. 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 No. <laughs> Don't forget me. <laughs> All opposed to the motion signify by saying nay. Nay, nay. All right. What was your vote? Aye. So we have a four to one vote for option number two. It's be Under protest, but anyway. Well, we don't really, you know, I, I would feel the same way you do, Steve, but with, like listen to Judge Ogre, but we don't really have time to pass it to the next meeting and do any more work. I mean, this is what's been offered up, and I said from the get-go, these are not three proposals that I would choose to go with, but that's what I've been served up with, and so I have to do what I have to do. 
Mr. Sheriff, I do think with this proposal and moving the lounge across the street, then I think, but thank goodness later in our docket, you've already filled 11 positions and are asking for more. So maybe we're giving you the personnel for the jury lounge. Well, my concern, and, and what you're saying is correct, my concern is the interaction between victims' families, mm -hmm. suspect families, and the jurors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they've got to come in and out of the courthouse called. anyhow. Um, and they come through the same port of entry. This will give them a different port of entry, at least. They can go across the street on a temporary basis for the lounge. Uh, they're going to go out to lunch. It's not, we don't have a perfect world. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, they're only using the lounge before they're impaneled. Correct. Exactly right. Okay. Item number um, 7B, ABSS. Chairman, Mr. Paisley, uh, and commissioners, uh, I'm here today uh, to request that uh, you all approve a budget amendment of $462,738 from the Southern High School Roof Project to the Graham Middle School Roof Project. Uh, currently, the Southern High School Roof Project is $992,000 under budget. Uh, we have discovered unsuitable roof decking at the Graham Middle School project, which requires a change order uh, and some fees for redesign, and the total uh, requested is $462,733.37. And Mr. Hook is actually speaking to item 7C. 7C. Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. Oh, it's oh okay. you shipped it on? No. <laughs> yeah. I apologize. I, okay. I had them out it's of order. Yeah. We can. All right. This is 7C like if you're looking on our agenda. Motion to approve. I got one question. Question. Um, I applaud the fact that you're under budget. Congratulations. Absolutely. But where's the other half a million dollars? Uh, it's, it's currently sitting in the Southern High School project. Um, I'd recommend to leave it there. Uh, Southern High School's under, under contract. Mm -hmm. I know we've spoken a lot about that uh, in the past. Uh, it's a really large project. If we leave it in the project, it will be available for future budget amendments or for uh, future um, change orders. I don't expect any, but it would, it would still leave it in the budget. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. I'm going to second. Uh, all in favor of this item 7C. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Passes. Please go to 7B. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a grant, by the way. I had them out of order. Um, so uh, recently I presented uh, a request uh, for uh, approval at our Board of Education meeting uh, for um, some needs-based grant applications. Uh, the reason I have to present these at both boards is because the application requires the signature of the uh, Board of Education Chair and the Board of Commissioner Chair. Um, so part of uh, what plays into the needs-based grants, it, there's an application um, and then there's a match component on the part of, uh, of the county. Uh, this year, because we're a Tier 2 county, uh, our uh, Alamance County match will be 25% on each of the grants. Currently, each of the uh, grant applications that I'm applying for are, are already fully funded. So across the uh, Southern Middle Gym Roof Project, the South Mebane uh, Partial Roof Project, and the Western uh, 
Alamance High School roof project, uh, you already have funding in place of $5,352,750. Um, if um, you all approved uh, submitting these needs-based grants, if we were approved for the grants, uh, then uh, that amount would be reduced that the county has to fund to $1,070,500, uh, $1, which would save the county $4,202,250, which would go back into available bond funds or, and or capital reserve funds because there's a mixture already applied for future roof and HVAC projects. Then I'll make a motion to approve that. I got one question. I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, these are a list of things that you uh, apply for. So it could be a situation where you maybe get two and lose two or get three and lose one. Well, the way the, way the application is, is judged, they have a rubric and you get some points if um, the, the projects you're applying for are listed in your 20, uh, 2020 uh, needs uh, facility needs assessments. So the way I chose these projects, uh, number one, I was looking for things that were already funded uh, by the county. Uh, and then number two, I was looking for what was listed in the 2020 uh, facility needs assessment that we submit to the state each year. And these three were listed as needing roofs in the 2020 facility needs assessment. We have some other projects that are funded currently, like the Western Alamance Middle School and the Eastern Alamance High School project. <coughs> and the Southern Alamance High School project, but they were not listed as needing roofs in the 2020 facility needs projects. So I, I prepared applications for these because you get more points on the rubric that is used to judge the projects at the state level. In addition, you get some points if they're already in design or further along, which all of these are, are in design. Excellent. And is this a state grant or is this a... Um, it, um, Yes, it's a state grant, okay. and it's, it comes from lottery funds, but it's not pulling from our lottery funds. It's gotcha. in addition, lottery funds. There's, a, there's something that's going on in the state called R&R &R funds? Yes. Okay. If this, is not a, this is not part of that? No, those are separate. Those okay. are separate funds. We've Excellent. used those funds in the, in the past. I've I, come here and, and asked for those. I hope we'll use them in the future because some of our things that we have to do actually meet their requirements. Yes, they do. Thank you, Chris. I'm absolutely in agreement. These grants will save us. Four million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're granted. If we're approved, no, yes, sir. No guarantees. Um, and I would encourage you to do more of this instead of less. I don't really, I keep bragging on this guy. <laughs> he's moving things uh, and he's, I, I, I like things. So, but on page, in our uh, notebook, it's page six. They're talking about a 20-year warranty. Uh, school system in the past has often not enforced warranties. I would encourage you, beg you, to have your attorneys look at these warranties carefully, make sure that they're solid, and they're going to be able to be enforced uh, is one. Question number two, each of these contracts, and they're obviously separate contracts, but each one of the, um, the bonds, item number, uh, well, it talks about the capital fund uh, application, and you're looking at 21,000, and I've forgotten which one this is. Um, it's one that has 480,000 600,000. That's the Southern uh, Middle School gym Thank roof. You. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, and it's got other charges or other costs, $21,300, and it lists may include items such as site survey, well, you're not surveying a roof, two materials, a material testing. I would hope you've already done the test. No, I, I can explain what these are for you. Please. That's okay. What so uh, if you uh, look at the way the application is set up, it has uh, a line for a dollar amount related to planning, uh, construction, and other costs. Uh, so on each of our roof projects, when I come here and request funds to put them in design, what we, what we have done, we've done it two different ways. Sometimes we'll request funds just to put it solely in design. Sometimes we'll request funds to put it 
in design and also cover construction administration, which covers the engineer company, REI engineers that we use, to go out and do monitoring and assessment of the ongoing work, monitoring the materials, uh, and judging, uh, you know, is the work up to the, to the contract standards. So I listed separately uh, the design, $39,000 on the, the one you've cited, uh, and then the construction administration, $21,300. But if you go back and look at what I requested for the uh, REI design and construction and administration here to, to this board, I requested those in one figure, but because the application is set up like this, I split them. So the $21,300 is for the construction administration with REI engineers. For their administration? Yes, construction administration. That's the monitoring that they put it out to bid. They help us to judge the bidders, find the lowest qualified bidder, and then they'll go on and monitor throughout the project, uh, sometimes uh, weekly, bi-weekly, and give us uh, engineering, engineering reports ongoing as to is the, the roofing contractor meeting meeting the, uh, uh, the, the, the specs the of the contract. Engineering report yes. solves my problem. Yes, sir. And answers the question. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll second your motion. Okay. Uh, <laughs> secondly, Mr. Hook, we, we applied for these last year, did we not? Yes. Um, didn't receive them? No, we, it was about six months ago. So back to Chairman and Mr. Paisley's, Paisley's comment about applying. Every six months, they will introduce new opportunities to apply. We applied um, six months ago. They only awarded them to Tier 1 counties, which we're not. They would be higher poverty and have less of a tax base. Uh, it's my understanding that they'll be considering some Tier 2 counties, so we'd be remiss not to at least put our applications in the pile. Are you more optimistic now? because they're considering Tier 2? Yes. Or do they consider Tier 2 last time and just opted not to fund those? Um, to, to, to my knowledge, I don't think they approved any Tier 2 counties, and, and they put all the funds towards Tier tier 1 counties. Uh, I think uh, the other piece, and we talked about this in OSC meeting about six months ago, is we collectively should uh, uh, speak to our representatives about uh, making sure they're aware that these are in the pile as well. I have. I've spoken to the our representatives about this. Thank you. That's when we started talking about the R and R, asking them to get on someone's throat and let's get this done. Because Alamance County needs it and I do believe we qualify for several of these things. So hopefully that happens. But I will make another phone call after this meeting today. <laughs> we appreciate your pull. <laughs> no, I was not gonna have much, but I'll keep talking. Miss Thompson. I just wanna make sure we've had some really heavy rains. How are we with leaks? We doing okay? <laughs> I think we're in good shape. I've mentioned uh, to both boards, uh, uh, we've got a lot of things in progress and under under contract, and we're catching up. Can't all be done at one time, but our maintenance department is very responsive about going out after heavy rains, and our response at this point where we have ongoing leaks is to change the ceiling tiles so we don't have any issues with mold from the ceiling tiles, and our contract uh, uh, custodial a uh, company helps us with any kind of cleanup that we need, and we continue on with teaching and learning, and we're moving these contracts on. So uh, I think we're in good shape, and, and we're just going to continue to work on, on these roofs. Well, I hope when you're talking about Tier 2, I hope whoever's scoring this stuff, so to speak, that they look back the history of what the school system has gone through with mold, and it has totally broke and devastated the system. It's, and the count, it's just been really tough, and I hope they realize... I hope they have a heart. <laughs> now, that, let's cut them some slack and give them a break here. I mean, that ain't the way you score grants and do grants, but, you know, it's something to pray about at least. We have a motion, a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Board, I'm going to jump in real quick here before Mr. Hook leaves the podium. Um, we had one more addition from the school system. This one's on me. They sent it a few weeks ago, and I've just had a chance to draft the resolution that's in front of you. Uh, one of the things that's required by law is when they surplus property, we have to have the option to buy it uh, or to acquire it from them before they give it to someone else. In this case, it's a small amount of property near the front of East Lawn Elementary that's going to be given to the state related to a widening of the road, so it's pretty perfunctory, but we do have to handle the process this way, so I have to give the board the resolution and the ability to vote on acquiring that very small piece of property. In this case, it's 0 .0245 acres of property and then several rights of way and an easement. So 
is a resolution in front of you, I would just ask for a vote on that. And if you have any questions before he leaves the podium, Mr. Hook will be able to answer those for you. Would you read the, the resolution? Uh, sure. Uh, whereas Alamance Burlington School System owns property located at 502 North Graham Hopedale Road, parcel ID 139799, which it uses for educational purposes at the East Lawn Elementary School here and after the property. And whereas on August 13, 2024, the ABSS School System Board of Education <coughs> approved the disposal and sale of 0.245 acres of the property to North Carolina Department of Transportation for a right of way, as well as the grant of 0.139 acres of the property for a permanent drainage easement and 0.308 acres for a permanent utility easement, altogether the surplus property as part of a road widening project. And whereas upon deeming the surplus property to be unnecessary and undesirable for public school purposes, the ABSS Board of Education declared the surplus property as real property surplus. And whereas the ABSS School Board of Education is required by North Carolina General Statute 115C518 to first offer the surplus property to Alamance County for purchase before any of their actions can be taken. And whereas if the Alamance County Board of Commissioners chooses not to obtain the surplus property, the ABSS Board of Education may dispose of the surplus property according to North Carolina General Statute 160A, Article 12. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby rejects the option to purchase the surplus property as offered by the ABSS Board of Education, so it may dispose of the surplus property in accordance with the provisions of North Carolina General Statute 160A, Article 12. Furthermore, it is the request of the Board of Commissioners that the proceeds of the sale of the surplus property be used to reduce the county's bond, bonded indebtedness for the Alamance Burlington School System or for any capital outlay purposes pursuant to the General Statute 115C 518A. Adopted this the 3rd of September 2024. And I will make that motion for the resolution. A motion. A second. And a motion and a second. Rick, how much? Um, I can find I, that number. I have that here. If you, Do you have that number, Greg? I mean, not, they, they made an offer of $88,175,000, and that's just to purchase the 0.25 acres. Uh, I counted back uh, plus $30,000, $118,175 to cover the cost of um, setting up the, the garden project at East Lawn. They have a, a, a it's, it's a cultural part of the school, a large outdoor garden. Uh, so the 30000 that I countered, uh, my plans would be to use to redo the fencing around uh, the garden, expand it some, but also redo the, the planting areas. They have raised planting beds with some watering systems, and I think the, the $30,000 that I countered should cover that. And that's coming from um, North Carolina Department of Transportation? Yes. And that's why we kept him at the podium. Question. I know the teacher that was there that did all of that work with the greenhouse and whatever everything. She's moved to another school. There was a question last week at the at your meeting about that grant following her to E.M. Holt. I mean, don't tell me if it's a secret. Just so, not. So th there are multiple grants yeah. at East Lawn. You have the continuing grants in place for the garden garden project. The grant you're speaking of is just for the greenhouse, right. and so e the Elon. A uh, group, Elon University group that's funding that is going to cover the cost of moving the greenhouse okay. from East Lawn to EM Holt. We've already chosen a, a site for that. So that's all in process of being moved to EM Holt. And so the goal is to continue that kind of program at East Lawn. East Lawn is going to ha continue with the garden, the current gardening project, not the greenhouse project. Right. The greenhouse will go to EM Holt. Okay. Okay. You have a motion. And a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hood. I've been threatened that if we don't have a five minute recess, uh, <laughs> we're going to take a five minute recess. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for having us today. Uh, a update, uh, of course, we're 10 days and counting for the Bloom Festival. Nice. Uh, there's still, we've done so much in the last five, six, seven months, and there's a lot to do in the last 10 days. So uh, to give you an idea, we have, we're going to have 10 bands, 24 balloons, 
We have 17 food trucks, 60 vendors, car show, which is going to be a sizable car show. And we've also added the uh, Jeep show, which is the off-road Jeeps with the big tires and wheels. And they're going to be doing their show as well, which they have their own group of people they will be bringing to the people's park. Uh, also, we will have uh, the, uh, a canine demonstration on Saturday, which is, which is going to be awesome. Uh, the train ride, kid zone, which will all be free, and the train will be for the kids to ride around up and down through the different areas of the park. And we're also going to have a hay ride, and that will all be, of course, free of charge to amuse the kids while the parents are hopefully shopping and through the vendors that we're going to have. Uh, we, our advertising this year is with uh, Odyssey Radio, which is 93.1 The Wolf and 98.7 The Simon. We increased our audience to 140,000 radio listeners, not including Fox 8 that we have uh, been on board with again this year. Uh, Bobby and I have the pleasure, since we can't drab Chuck, uh, Bobby and I have the pleasure of going next Monday to be on Fox 8 again to promote Alamance County, the Bloom Festival, Alco Vets. What time are they going to do that? Uh, that'll be uh, Monday morning at 7.30, 8 o'clock. I think we're on the 8th. The Simon Radio alone is 230,000. We're reaching over 300 and like 70,000 people right. right now. And advertising for our county, we'll be playing something so our online tickets are, are high. The, the anticipation of the people we have are, you know, the, the number of balloons that we have, we don't have them all what we have called sponsors, but they are, you know, it always seems to be a last-minute thing. But as you guys are facing, we are facing it just as bad. We do not have sponsors. This is, has been a very disheartening year, uh, the number of sponsors we had. Our costs continue to rise and our sponsorships have dropped considerably. In fact, as of Monday's meeting, we had nine balloon sponsored. So that's, that's where we Sorry, get a, what, nine. nine balloon sponsored. That means we have, nine peop, we have nine sponsors of the 24 balloons. Last year, we were able to sell them all out. This year, it hasn't been that easy. So we're down to 10 days, and we got to start selling. We're doing our best, but, you know, it's... How much it, is the sponsorship? It ranges 2500 for balloon it's 2500 and it's tough today you, as you, as we're sitting here talking about money for schools and money for this and that you know now you know we got veterans who are feeling it's just as bad we just had unfortunately a veteran uh, we didn't lose him but you know he's this is tough for the veterans you know uh, you know we last time I appeared before the commissioners, we asked about the fee to be set aside, considering the amount of work and the amount of money that we put into the park, into the uh, community. You know, Elko Vets, we have to spend, just like you guys know, I heard Pam say it three times, and I counted it. You have to spend money to make money. We have to spend money to have these festivals to draw people so that we could hopefully reach so people think we do this for, because we're a bunch of partiers. I have sad news for them. We are an outreach group. The more veterans that we can reach every day, that's how many lives we can save. That is super important to us. It's not about the bands. It's not about the balloons. It's about the veterans, and only about the veterans. So I want you to have the understanding that while we're here and while we do these things, and it seems fun, which a lot of you have have had your full, fair share of volunteering. This is a considerable amount of work. We've been working on this for seven months, and we started late. We really didn't start late this year. So, uh, I, I, I am asking: Are we? Can we make a decision on <coughs> possibly uh, relieving us of the four thousand dollar fee for using the park? And I ask that in respect that the amount of money. Just last year that we put in power, roads, rebuild things. Uh, actually, we actually did something for the park that, that somebody did out of the kindness of his heart. In the middle of chaos, we went down and rebuilt one of the sections of the Frisbee golf so they can have that tournament the next month, the next week. 
If we wouldn't have done that, the contract that they hired for $10,000 slid off into the creek. We went down and grabbed mine, and we rebuilt that road and never charged a penny. So, you know, it's a give and take. We understand that we are asking a lot. We give a lot, and we're asking for some return this year. Uh, we, are, we are in desperate need for it. Uh, again, 4,000, if I can give you how many power bills, how many cars we can repair for veterans to get back and forth, how much we can uh, repair bathrooms, ramps. We now have a ramp system where we're able to go in and take ramps and put them back up for veterans at no cost. You know, and out of the goodness of people's heart, they, they're giving to us because they know that we're repurposing them. So, you know, this is a lot of work. This is, this is not just a one time a year event for us. This is 365 days a year, just like you guys worry about the county. We worry about these veterans constantly. And we, we come to ask you Mr. for this. Chaplain, before you get in, even to that, I've read your charter and your bylaws. Yes, sir. How much are each of you officers paid? Oh, my sir? gosh. You shouldn't believe how much they pay me. <laughs> the answer is zero. They are That's not paid zero. a penny. That's correct. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a love of work. I mean, it, it, sometimes it's like law enforcement and school teaching. They don't get paid enough. They do it because, you know, I'm a veteran. Bobby's a veteran. But Chuck's not. Chuck, <laughs> I can't tell you how much time he puts into this and his family. It's just, it's enormous. Uh, so with that being said, I hope this update brings you up to speed. I hope we see all the ends at the festival we really you know friday is going to be the uh the uh media rides and all the things unfortunately i won't be there this friday the first friday uh i have an obligation with work uh as you can see i work for the haas f1 team uh so i i have i have to do a lot of work for them too so but uh chuck and bobby will be there to orchestrate the first day it'll be it'll go without a hitch uh we would like the uh no rain. No, no no there's no yeah, there's no rain. Without a hitch, okay? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say we always we we don't ex we don't expect but we always prepare. So uh any can I answer any questions, any comments? Uh again this year we 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 have been uh Chuck has been working with some of the people at the park about yeah, the Garrett House. We're still, you know, that that's and we're fixing up to the stage. yeah, that's hundreds of dollars mm -hmm. just in material. Repeat if, that so people out in radio. So here. what it is is the power at Garrett House and where we put the stage at in the very back of that area has to be updated. We're not asking the park. Chuck, come up here and help me. Out. <laughs> Chuck. So, the, so the stage that we don't even use has lost its power. So we're going to be out there later this week fixing all the power down there. It's the one they use for bluegrass bands. Yeah, that's the it's, one down that, by the pond. Where we'll be tethering the balloons at. So, yeah. yeah, we'll be working on that this week, hopefully, and get that done. But anyway, we've made a lot of costs. But this, this year alone, we've already worked, I would say, right at 23 events. We've already worked as an organization. We spent this last weekend down in Silk Hope. Um, we took our trams down there so we could put our signs all over them, and we rode around and got rain on for two days, it seemed like, and <laughs> well appreciated and well received in that community. That community is very supportive. They always spend t tons of money on our raffle. This year we're all raffling off the razor. The idea is to get it paid for right now, so uh, if anybody wants to buy a ticket with 20 bucks, it's a good opportunity. Dodgers are for you. But uh, although the biggest thing with the razor this year was to bring awareness. And so anytime we have a raffle is to go out and sell tickets and great awareness more than anything. We made some great friends this weekend. In fact, we had one lady that show up and she sold more tickets than any of us. She wouldn't let nobody cross our path. And so it's just amazing the relationships we forged. The biggest thing we're having right now is with our vets, is the young guys that have, um, um, I think when you pull out of countries like we have, that there's a discourse and distrust with our government now more than ever. We're not the government, so we're able to reach some of these guys. And so that's the battle right now we're having. So, any questions? Richard, if you will, talk about uh, the last two or three years, some of the things that you've voluntarily given and their economic impact to Cedar Rock Park on. So, uh, 
I, I don't have the, the, that particular spreadsheet. The spreadsheet I have is how much we put into the festival, which was well over $100,000 it takes us to put on the festival. And what types of things? Would so that, that goes towards uh, tents. Uh, that goes towards road improvements. That goes to power improvements. That goes to bringing in ice for the vendors. It, uh, it goes into it, everything that the park cannot provide, we have to bring in. So therefore, like I said, the food vendors, we have to bring in extra gravel, three, four, five, you know, dump truck loads of gravel just in case just in case it rains, just in case we have a washout, that's a couple thousand dollars. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at when we can take a power bill for five, six hundred bucks from a veteran so he can have power or he can have air conditioning for the rest of the summer, it means a lot to us. Uh, it really does. It really touches home when we have to spend, but we know that's part of the cost of doing, doing the uh, festival. But the $4,000 that is added on to us Again, it's another cost that we have to occur that uh, we have to find. We, we were trying to, we usually have somebody that, a sponsorship that says, okay, we'll cover the bands or we'll cover the, we'll cover this, we'll cover that. We'll cover the cost of the park. These people are not coming forward anymore. They're not here. We don't know why. Well, we know why. I'm sorry. That was, that was ignorant, but that we know why. With one of the years he had a lot of rain, which was what, two years ago, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, I heard a rumor that in fact I saw, <laughs> uh, you guys reseeded the field. Yes, sir. We reseeded uh, three of the fields, and the one that we actually had to put Chuck in everybody's vehicle to get him out, <laughs> and then we had to bring gravel that we fortunately we had, and we we repaired, and then we went back out the following for a solid week and did nothing but repairs to fields, to entrance areas, to fencing. Anything that was damaged, I can, I can sit here and feel confident saying we left that park in 25 to 30% better than it was when we, left, when we found it. And that's our goal. It's a people's park. We want people to come. We want people to see it. We want them to come and be a part of us and be well, part of Alamance you County. Culverts, you put in piping, you put oh, in gravel. Yeah, so oh. in order to be able to get over to certain parking lots, yes, we had to put in culverts. We had to, uh, like you said, reseed. The gravel's the big thing. The gravel's not cheap. Nope. And then, you know, we, you, know you, could, you got to move it around, and uh, you got to have qualified people to do that. So, Mr. Chairman, you asked a question about economic impact. Mm -hmm. I asked uh, Mr. Baker... To if we had any information about economic impact, and we don't have any details about the dollars, but Mr. Baker, could you share what you learned? Yeah, we do have the ability to track um, how many people come, and over the past couple of years, I think we saw 9,000 people over the course of the weekend. <clears throat> over a four-day, three or four-day period, yeah. 9,000 people. And that's in inclement weather for two years. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's going to be bright, sunny skies. <laughs> Mid seventies, and there's going to be twenty thousand people. Uh, I mean, you guys remember the days when we used to go out to the airport and see? I mean, there there was big numbers out at the airport, and that's what we want to see for Alamance County out at the uh, the People's Park. That's what we would hope that uh, we could contribute. You know, not only that we're buying rooms for these people to have these balloons. Now we have to pay. So these balloonists, they're they're balloonists. They have to have compensation. They have to, we have to buy rooms. We have to pay a certain dollar amount to get them here. Uh, you know, that's the idea of having uh, sponsors to cover their costs. Well, this year we don't have it. Uh, Does so, states will still have a balloon festival? They used to at one Yes, time. sir, they, they do. Still have, when do they have theirs? October. October. In October? Yeah, I, was, I was in Statesville for about five years. And, uh, that's right, Bloom Meister, the lady that runs that. She costs us $25. Marsha. Beg your pardon? $25. You have to have what they call Balloon Meister. She's right. the woman who manages the, all the balloons. The, I mean, the it's. It's about 10 grand. It's. Do they have it there? Do you know? I'm not sure. I've never asked her, but she'll. Their event is usually the third week in October, weekend in October. You have Albuquerque, which is a nine day rally. Uh, then those pilots drive back from New Mexico with a Statesville rally. And it's usually 
35 to 50 balloons. Wow. Well, it, it, tw it, it 30 balloons in, the, in our launch field, and when they do the glow, it is spectacular. I recommend everyone, if they're going to do, if they don't fly, they do glows. Glows is when they put the balloons up, and it gets about dusk, and they start firing off those, and it lights up the area, and it's absolutely beautiful. It really is. Uh, if, uh, the sheriff provides security for it. Absolutely. Terry Johnson, uh, Sheriff Johnson has, has been a big supporter for us. Uh, and on and some of the other people that, uh, that work for Terry, that work for us, it, they come to show up to help. They just do it because they want to help the veterans. And you can't, I don't know how you put a dollar on that. Or how do you, how can you say thank you? So. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Did you need to go, Steve? Um, daughter of a veteran and mother of a veteran. So I understand um, um, the last four months that my son was in the Army, one of his, was a sergeant, and one of his soldiers took his life. So I understand when it comes down to helping veterans, because that's big, what they're coming back from now. But at the same time, when you decided to have this out at Cedar Rock Park, and, and you know I didn't think it was the right place, because I didn't think it was big enough for you that could really meet your needs as far as to really take it off and do what you needed to for parking and all that. Not the balloon festival itself, just the location. I was real concerned. And all of these upgrades that you've done have been on your decisions, right? The electrical, I mean, that's been a gracious gift to you. because They I were just, yeah, they were based on needs. Right. Yes, ma'am. I just um, asked our Recreation and Parks Director, at any time did anyone in the county ask you to do this as far as this for this stage and that for that stage and, and gravel to handle what you've got to do at this location? Um, because I'm seeing the staff time that the county spent was 3,200, equipment was 4,500, staff time with the sheriff's department was 15,000, um, Alamance Parks and Rec was 4,100, materials 2,400. So a total of what it cost the county was $29,416.61. I know I discovered that before when you guys are starting the Chestnut Ridge, which is amazing, that the county was gracious to give you a construction dumpster, take it up there, and get it, take it back several times, and that too was in the thousands that the fee was waived. There is no amount of money that you can give back to a soldier. I mean, I just saw where Turkey, they tried to attack some of our two Marines over there. I mean, it's just all the time. There, 13 of our soldiers died over in Kabul, and you know, that, and our, our whatever hadn't even called their parents to see how they're doing. One person went with them to Arlington. And so I, I just have to say this, um, whereas this is coming off for veterans, you guys made this choice to have it there, and I'm Absolutely. glad you did. But at the same time, your county has given you almost $30,000 in services. So and i got to look at it that way. Absolutely. So, so let's look at some of that cost. Please so, do. Yeah, so let's look like the emergency management. The first year, they asked us to come out. We didn't, they, they asked us, they came to us and they said, hey, we need some training time. We need operational awareness. How does this work? Can we come out? Absolutely. Come on out. And then they came the second year. They were, they were always welcome. They, it wasn't something we asked for. That's, that was a huge cost. I don't know what it was, but that's a huge cost to bring that trailer out and put up the satellites and put up the personnel. But that, I mean, that, I thought we were doing the county a favor because we were providing them a training atmosphere. God forbid if there was an emergency in Alamance County, they would know what to do with 10,000 people. So we, I didn't see that cost. Now, the cost with Terry, uh, Sheriff Johnson, uh, that, I'm going to let Chuck speak to that. Chuck, well, let, let the sheriff speak to that. Okay. Yeah, I would, let I would me like say, to... I, have, I have seen no figures, period. So this number of fifteen thousand dollars is not I have your no number. idea. Uh, you know, we had deputies out there that got yeah, paid. Some know. volunteers, some got paid, but I have no idea where the fifteen thousand dollars came from. Yeah. So that's a number we don't know where it came from. Exactly. Who, who supplied the, the, the data? We put this memo together back yeah. in. Um, so I had yeah. put in a request to David Sykes to ask him about the cost for this sheriff personnel there and then he um, transferred me on over to payroll and payroll ran it. Okay. 
Thank but you. part of your folks are volunteers, not paid. I'll so, be out there, and I'm not going to get paid. <laughs> so, here. so, so here's a question. Okay. So, first of all, we couldn't find anywhere else in the in the county to do it. I went to. I went to Dewey's place. I went to the Speedway. I have power lines everywhere. I spent a solid week, which I got paid a lot of money to do, like I always do. <laughs> I'm giving back to this great country. And right now, more than ever, we need stuff like this, not just for our vets, but for our county, because we're at a long time low on public opinion about our nation. So it's not needed just for our military. It's needed for everybody. <clears throat> the second thing is, it's like we have things that we, we do so many events, me and my wife sponsor every year. I mean, I think it's around 20 events in Graham alone. And we're bringing back arts around the square, and we asked for it to come back. They budgeted. So I don't want to hurt your department. I don't want to hurt your department. But you guys, I'm asking you all to put in your budget to co help cover this event, okay? It's not fair to them to pull out their budget for something they wasn't expected. We're trying to cushion the blow on them down there because they all the extra stuff we do down there. Now, when this all got started with the park, it started seven years ago. Wasn't my idea to bring the Bloom Festival back. It was the balloonists that contacted me. And they said, hey, look, you're the only nonprofit we know in the county that receives no money, that's based in Alamance County, that is going to bring this type of value that you're already bringing. And you're out beating the bushes all the time. Why? Because we can't tell a vet no. Okay? Whether it's like in a neighboring county that, that we go out there and we sell tickets, about $8,000 worth of tickets in a weekend. I could easily move it to Guilford County because there's an event venue over there would gladly accept us and we'll be out there this Thursday night at their thing again. We're out there at least once a month. They wouldn't even charge me a dime to bring it out there because their child is a veteran that's struggling really bad right now, okay? So it all started really simple here, okay? So when we went, we looked and looked and looked and the only place that we could find which was not conducive was Cedar Rock Park. Okay, so it was not even permitted back then to have any event, whether it was a Frisbee golf tournament or anything, to have this event. So we went and we said, would y'all be willing to allow us to use the park? Okay, we met multiple times with the rec board, and it, to the point that we, when we started studying this event and we realized that one Bloom Meister wanted $5,000 and then told us it cost him $70,000 to remortgage his house, we don't have that kind of money, and we're not coming out of our personal pocket. Everything has to be sustainable. So every year, has it generated a little money for us? Of sure. But it doesn't matter if it don't generate a dime. It will happen this year if it costs our organization money, because if we save one life, what is it worth? We're not reaching the people by them going to a government building of any sort. We're going out there and beating the bushes and meeting these, not the vet. We're meeting the mother, the father, the son that said, can you help? And I'm not a veteran. So I can't go and do peer-to-peer -peer counseling, but I keep saying I can create the environment for it. So what happens is we call one of the other vets. I've had vets call me at 2 o'clock in the morning that's been on the phone for two hours. They talk people down from killing themselves. Now, I can't talk them down because I haven't experienced that stuff, but I am on the phone from 2 to 4 in the morning now letting him vent to me. I'm not complaining because it was worth a life, right? So when it comes down to it, we were just trying to create awareness. We were asked to do the Bloom Festival. We looked at multiple places to do it. If the county doesn't want there, it's fine. It's easy for me to move it. But I felt like we'd lost our signature event here when you lost the Bloom Festival. And I felt like because it was enough people, not just one, multiple sources coming to me going, you need to bring it back, you need to bring it back. And then we thought, okay, well this, if we don't make a dollar and we save a life, then what was this worth? You know, have we generated money every year? Yes, and everything we generate is going to the mountain. Did the county do me a favor and bring me dumpsters? Yes, but you know what, Ms. Thompson, we're, these are veterans too, okay? You and we all are in this. We're all this together. Mr. Tally, and you know, I know that, and I don't. And I hear it in your voice. And I'm not your enemy. If anything, I'm your biggest fan. But as a county commissioner, when I see thirty thousand, I have to ask about that because all five of these commissioners have said we don't want to support. They haven't agreed profits. to give the money right now, guys. If you don't want to discount, it's fine. We're still going to do the work we always do. The first year we went out there, there was some talk about it. They weren't going to charge us. And on the back side of this, we got charged. We were told up front we wouldn't cost us anything. And the reason we offered to do the work is because in the very first meeting I met with the board, I told them that we would leave the park in better shape. If we had to use the park, we would leave it in better shape. Because right now, it ain't your park. It's the people's park because they pay the taxes. And you're representing the people. And if the people don't want this event out there, I'm okay with it. Okay? But we decided that if we went out there, that we wouldn't go, I could go out there and run generators. It wasn't a problem. I can put 10 generators out there. 
But I didn't want to do that because I thought that if that noise would agitate a veteran that we're trying to put around a group of people. I, didn't, I needed one less noise out there. I needed to hear music or something. So we decided that we were trying to make the park better and more conducive, which the park has used everything that we've done out there. They've used it at one time or another. So it's not like we put something that we're taking back up. We're trying to make improvements to the park. We actually said in the very beginning, John, and I think you were at that meeting in the very beginning, that if we were to start generating enough money at this event, that we would like to set aside money to build a stage out there and have it named after our military, Alamance County Barons of Alamance County. And I said, but we would come back to, to the county commissioners, which at the time he wasn't, and said that we would come back and ask for a 50-50 deal like I do in Graham when I'm trying to buy Christmas lights that cost $58,000. I generate half the money, and then I ask the city to match it. And I thought, so if we can generate $50,000 over a period of time and set aside every year so much money aside, then we come back and say, okay, it's going to cost $100,000 for the stage. We're willing to go in and help build it. Let me indicate early on, when this first started, I was one of those pilots flying in the event, flying in events all over the country in competition. And I was one of those pilots that asked these guys to help us out. Uh, you know, veteran services can't do a lot, don't have the ability to do what these folks do. Uh, they do so much more than veteran. Veteran services does a great job. They do. They do a really good, good job. We do a really good job, and we would not exist without the BSO office. Yeah, right. We and would not exist without BSO. I understand. We would not Veteran exist. Veteran services has limited resources that are provided primarily by the federal government, also by the county and whatever. But these folks do a lot of many, many, many services mm -hmm. that Veteran services does not have the ability to do, they don't have the personnel to do it, and they don't have the money to do it. Uh, John, there's a so trust, there's a trust factor. I'm that yeah. ask them to do this. I'm no longer, unfortunately, last two years, able to fly in their event because I have a little balance thing, which we're working on uh, three times a week, by the way, with a therapist right now. <laughs> so well, the thing that we're running someday we're, I'll be able to fly again, but not we want you to. today. So I do not have a conflict of interest in this matter. So, but these folks we're, uh, we're, do so much, and I'm requesting that we allow them to continue to help. Look, we're going to pay the forty-four hundred dollars, John. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay, I don't want y'all to vote on it. Wait a minute. We'll take care of it. Okay. I'm asking that we Done. offset part, or maybe all of the four thousand dollars with services that they, improvements that they provide to Cedar Rock Park. If that's a motion, I'll second it. That is a motion. Any more discussion? The thing is that I want to say one thing about organization is the factor, the, what we're running into right now is these young guys with post-war problems don't trust any government identity at all. None. And so what we're trying to build up on the mountain is not a government organization. I can help build it, but I won't be up there because once again, I'm not a vet. And I can't, they don't, they open up to each other. It's just brotherhood. Yeah. And they trust each other. And that's all we're trying to do is create an environment for them, and this here was supposed to be, the reason we considered on doing this, because this has started coming together, we thought this could help keep that sustainable so we can carry it for years. Thing. The road going up to the fire tower oh. did not meet code and had to be improved uh, for your facility and for all the citizens that live on that road. Oh, we're heroes up and there now. Who, who did all those repairs? Alcovets. Are we, we were you paid? Wait a minute. Were Sorry. you paid to do it? Mm -hmm. no. You were paid to do it? No. Uh -uh. no. You weren't no, paid, we paid a penny. No, you we did it penny. out of your own pocket. Right. And that helped Alamance County. Yes. Mm -hmm. so there's countless about. hours on the, those, those turnoffs had to be, those tires had to be tested to hold a fire truck. I mean, we, we had to really work stitched. hard to get that. Fire tower road to where it was passable so that we could get our permits 
to hopefully start building. And you did that all with your own equipment, own equipment mm -hmm. and your money. own personnel yes. mm -hmm. and your own materials. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Just a, a comment before we vote, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I love this Bloom Festival. I was I grew up here and remember the Bloom Festival at the airport. Uh, it's, a, it's a great event. It always has been. Um, I'm a veteran. I'm a member of Alco Vets. I love you guys. I love your mission. I love what you do for the county. I've been to Chestnut Ridge, and I understand what you do. Um, I, to me, though, we, we've got a policy. We have to follow the policy. If we don't follow the policy all the time, then it's not fair. So uh, I would vote against this. Uh, there's no indication of what you guys do, but it's just from the fairness perspective for me. But thank you for everything you do, and I'll be out there. Thank you. Thank you. And just one more thing. Whenever um, I went with you, and we made Carson go with us. Yeah, I, it was, that road, I remember you up there. It was, that godforsaken road is like in Roaders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> and we saw all those cars from Mr. Chestnut. I thought I was going to have to marry him. And uh, precious, precious man that just gave everything he had as a, as a Marine and as just a heart and a good, good man. And um, I would have helped you any way to get what you could, and I still would. But you're going to have to, when I see these figures, you've made this choice to do this for your nonprofit. Just please let me finish. I know Amy and Dennis and Steve got you thousands of dollars because I came 50, to your fundraiser and donated correct. and they should and we spent it up there I, I, in a second but um I, I just understand that when I hear uh, some of us we've had nonprofits before when art money come in there were 29 we met up there and and I've, I'm the first one to run to their rescue because I've worked for two I know what you do but at the same time if we're going to do for one we're going to do for all and I think we should do for all because they do the work that nobody else wants to do. So, um, that's... Ms. Thompson, the reason we took you up there because she was really supportive of the military. Yeah, still And am. we met with you numerous times before you run the first time as an organization. And we felt like you were getting behind us, and that's why and we did. took you up there. I did. Okay? Because I knew I could not get you water and sewer with all those cars. Right. So, Let you me don't mention. have to remind me. But I, I just want to make sure that the $4,400 doesn't matter that much to us. It's just something they felt like that we might could use this year. We'll be fine just without it, okay? But let me also mention that we do give to nonprofits. We do. We're talking we about when we met with out all of our them. budget well, given each and every year. Well, I'm cross, sorry. I didn't mean for example. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and they do a wonderful job as well. But we fund that out of our budget so they don't have to come begging for, and I understand you're not begging. No. Uh, no. For just consideration for an offset for the improvements that they make to our facilities. That's all I'm asking. I agree. I have, um, I just have a, I just want to say something here because. <laughs> Instead of like us like giving this to a nonprofit, which I think it's that's okay. Why couldn't we get them to give us an invoice for the work that they do? So we just pay you. No, I'm, just, I'm being being serious. If you did that, if you do that work, and I know that you guys do, well, if you just gave us an invoice, we just pay for it, and I guarantee you, it would be more than forty four hundred bucks. I think. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I think, you, I think you'd be shocked to see how much the labor cost. I think, I think the would be shocked to see that you probably did a, a whole lot more than uh, the thirty thousand dollars that, that uh, assuming that that's what they gave. You. If this event carries on, I think what I would like to see is it become more of a county partnership sanction mm -hmm. event with us, so that way y'all can budget to cover the sheriff. You can cover the rec department that we can. And you can cover things like that, okay? Well, that would, to me, would be like the winner because we're not trying to burden the taxpayers or their right. department either. We're not that organization, you understand? Mm -hmm. We feel like we fend for ourselves. I don't have to do the work. And, in fact, I thought about not doing the work this year, but we started the process of pulling the permits this morning, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's my crew that goes out and does the work. And if I was billing you, we're licensed. We have multiple licenses. You know, we have six licenses in our corporate in our company. Uh, and one of them is electrical, so uh, we were going to go out and do the work, and we should continue, we're going to continue to do the work out there. The idea was, when we started this, that some of the talk was, is how does it look using county, the people's property, and closing the park down for a three-day weekend so the average taxpayer could not use the park? That was the conversation. And I said, 
Well, one, re one way to do it is you look at us as being the only nonprofit that's based as a 501c3 based in Alamance County. You could look at it that way. If I could find a venue tomorrow, it, I wouldn't be moving it out of spite because we don't regret doing this stuff and I still want to do stuff at the park because I think it's good for our military to get out there and mm -hmm. wind down at it. I would still want to do improvements to the park, but if I could find a more conducive area that would work, I would have already moved it, okay? And don't think we're not looking. We look every year, we make some discussions. I'm not gonna move it to another county, which I've been invited to. I'm not gonna do that because this is an elements-based organization. We didn't start out to do this. Thank God that VSO wanted to do a parade, then we we'll line up some trucks, you know, and we thought, okay, we seem to be, at, well, the older vets, we seen them having a, a sort of like this healing process that we were watching at the parade and we thought okay maybe we should line the trucks up so they just don't drive off and that led from there to somebody wanting a band i was on the committee with the parade and i said i'll get you a band and then i went out i called two business owners i knew and i went out i just bought a business so i was like i really don't have the money to dump in a fifteen hundred dollar band right now i need to go and raise some money and less than 45 men men of vietnam vet raised uh 45 raised uh what was it? We raised uh, $3,000 in 45 minutes. We had another vet that spoke out at the meeting because he didn't hear him and he thought the extra money, I was just gonna make it. I was like, no, I don't want the money. I'm gonna give it all back. I do not want it. It was not intent for me to raise 3,000. It was to get 1,500. And so the next, he called me three days later and he had $2,500 donated to the vets of Alamance County. And so that's what I started. I normally don't like getting up and talking because I'm not a vet. And I think it's them and it's their growth thing and it's the thing that they need to do, especially with the young vets. It's not one aspect of our business. It's like building confidence in these guys that they can be efficient in the community and that they can step in front of a crowd and say something, not make a mistake like me. I don't like doing this anyway, but it's a growth process. It's not one thing that we're looking at with this organization. It's not one thing. It's not the ramp that we took down from a vet because his wife don't want to look at it no more on Monday, and she's like, come and grab the ramp. Can you please move it? It hurts too much. And so, and I want to announce this. We were given last week a $37,000 car, a handicapped van that's fully set up for somebody that's even, you know, that's, as long as they can move their arms, they can drive it. It was given to this organization. We're getting it detailed this week. I'm looking for a recipient of this. I'm, we're taking applications. We're trying to find a vet that needs this van. Currently, that van right now today, he was about brand new, was around $90,000. And we had a vet that was pre-Vietnam that found out about us, and I went and met with him for a couple hours, and he gifted the van to us a couple weeks ago. So we're looking for a home for that. But it just, I mean, if I sat down, and, I mean, I told Bobby, I said, I know we can't get paid, but we're going to have to find somebody we can pay because we can't do all this. I mean, it's just like a full-time job with me and Bobby. And I mean, and Richard, I mean, Richard, his job goes away and the unfortunate problem being self-employed, I neglect my job sometimes and I depend on my crews because I'm like, I got to go again, you know? So at any given moment, I'm on the road doing this. And if I sat down and added up the man hours that, okay, so last year it cost us around $80,000 to put the balloon festival on. 80,000, okay? We have to raise that money. But if we added on the amount of hours at just a standard hour rate that we put into this event, it would exceed any profit we ever made, okay? So to us, it's important that we have something positive, this patriotic, this is a 9-11 weekend typically, that we're trying to say this still is the greatest country on the face of the earth, even though we're being beat up right now. And I think it's important that we do this for our vets and not only for our vets, for our community. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay? I'm not asking anything, but if you want to put it in your budget next year, it's fine. But if y'all know of a place where I can move it to, where I have plenty of acreage that's wide open, I'm all on board to do that, and I'll spend money on their land too. Okay? <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you. Gentlemen, we appreciate it. We have a motion on the floor and a second. Um, I'm voting for it. I feel like... This group does wonderful things for Alamance County, and not just for the veterans, but for the veterans and the entire county. Okay. I feel like um, somebody's offered us a large gift, and we're spitting in their eye at this point. I think my motion is, if anything, an undercut, asking just for an offset and asking for you to keep up with the financial gain that you're giving to us. So I feel like this is an undercut motion. It sh I should be asking for much more. 
but my motion and the second is for offsetting the $4,000 cost with improvements that you give to the county. That's a motion. Any other comments? All in favor of the uh, motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. So it's 3 2. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. It was approved, <coughs> by the way. Thank you. Okay. Terry, that's a hard show to follow. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> commissioners. I'm here to report today. Y'all were so great to allow us to give what we call a hiring bonus uh, for employees because we were so short of personnel. Putting my glasses on so I can read this. We've had, since July 1st, we have had 93 total applications. Wow. Now, the bad part, 65 applications were reject, rejected due to drug use, criminal history, no driver's license, employment issues with other law enforcement agency, and the inability to pass the psychological. Folks, we're probably one of the few agencies in this state that requires psychological testing. All uh, law enforcement is supposed to do that now. But we also run a polygraph and do an in-depth background. Of those uh, 93 applications, like I say, 65 were kicked to the side because of their previous history. 28 remaining in the application process. 12 of the 28 have already been moved through the process and given conditional officers, offers. Upcoming swearing in will be uh, 12 incoming hires. There'll be one detention. Uh, and one deputy on 9 9 2024. There'll be four detention and two deputies on 9 23 24, and two detention and two deputies on 10 7 20 24. That's 12 new, uh, excuse me, uh, 16 total applicants that will be coming on. I'm back to ask, you said when we got 10 hired <laughs> to come back. Well, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we are still receiving applications. What uh, y'all may not understand, there'd probably be a whole lot more, but there's so much background investigation with all these applicants. It's, it's really overwhelmed our personnel division, but we're taking care of it as we go. I'm back to ask, can we hire 10 more? Mr. Hunter, any comments? I mean, Sheriff said come back. Jeff's right about what we said. Mr. Carter, yeah, he said we said come back, and we said if he came back, we would. So that's what I remember. <laughs> that's what I remember. So, Mr. Lashley, uh, I agree with the other two commissioners. I do have one one quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, are all these in that same group that we just uh, approved money for uh, the ten thousand with the? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, with, sir. With uh, with uh, a contract. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. The ones, the ones we're hiring is signing the contract. Excellent. Thank well, you. Mr. Thompson. You said you're hiring 16? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you hired, we gave you this bonus for 10. Yes, ma'am. The other six comes out of your contract? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. I was uh, at a conference and met a um, law enforcement officer that was, they had the, the security for all that and not knowing him. I just asked him if I could ask a question. And I said, um, Tell what we're going through, and I'm sure you know their sheriff, but I'm not going to mention it. And um, he said, we were going through the same thing. He said they have a standard, I think it was maybe $5,000 bonus. But he said that um, their sheriff had to take a step back and realize, look at the big picture of why people were leaving and why it was such a struggle, because criminal don't work at law enforcement. <laughs> I don't want that. Um, and they said they had to really take a step back and look at as to why people were exiting and stuff like that. And I'm sure you already do that. But it was, um, it's across the border, so to speak. When it, it is. Things like this. And um, I would think your application pool is getting smaller 
because of the, the real passion and the purpose to be something like this, like teachers, nurses, soldiers, anybody, pastors. And so, um, but I, I just, um, so that's, you're asking for how much this time? Enough to at least get 10 more and then we're coming back. <laughs> So is this another 100000 or is it 200000 No. It depends on whether they serve the two years. No, no, no. I'm asking what his amount is. I know you got that contract and all that done, but it's, his request is another 100000 Another just, 10 employees, yes. So that's 10 times 10. That's 100000 yeah. uh, But I was thinking that, that if doing the math right, gave you, gave you money for 10 Right, you you've got money for ten. We get five thousand. Once they sign on, then every two months afterwards, another thousand dollars until they get. Based on your numbers, uh, we, you have the money for the ten, and you have six left over. So if we give you another a hundred grand, that's only going to get get you four. Well, it depends on he's. Able to come back, and it's I'm, not yeah. bashful. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I know that they're, uh, you know, with the quote <coughs> lap salaries, if you want to say that, uh, there's more than sufficient amount to cover till we get full. But the commissioners have, y'all made an agreement with me to, uh, you know, after we did 10, you'd do 10 more. Absolutely. After that 10, you'd do 10 more. Well, what is this money well, if you'll recall, my recommendation, recommendation in the first place Last was dollars. that we not put a 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 requirement on it. Let's just give them a blanket and say, get it done. And he, he proved that's, that you That's the way I took it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also got another 30, 40 to go. Yeah. Right. Well, I just made a motion to approve an additional 10. Second. Where does this come out of? Lap salaries. Lap salaries. Okay, exactly. It's already covered. Uh, after July 31st, we had enough money from lap salaries to take care of this. Yes, sir. That's what I was told. Have a motion and a second. Any other and, discussion? Oh. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Also, uh, let me let you know, well, too. Well, oh, you got to take a vote. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, a lot of people are jumping ship to come with us, too. That's Some good. of these, we, we're not going to have to train. We're going to be able to put them out on the road and in the detention center Excellent. and not yeah, have to pay for training. <laughs> I, yeah. was look, I was telling Jackie I thought I might see him in like two or three months, and he did it in like 16, uh, six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for doing this for, for the sheriff's office and thank you for what you do awesome thank you okay it is I think we can wrap up 120 at this point yeah yeah yours <laughs> We're going to give you three and a half minutes. No. <laughs> should, be, should be more than enough. Um, so I think you've been handed um, a copy of this presentation. We've got one for you, Thomas. Um, just because it's a lot of numbers and a little hard to read. Um, so you'll remember that uh, at the end of last year, we began a process to do a comprehensive evaluation of the roof and HVAC systems. Uh, both the school system and all of the county buildings. Uh, we got an interim report back um, early this year in enough time to allow us to decide how to spend the bond proceeds that were available to us. So this is that list. This is the initial um, top list of, of priorities for the school system. Um, And uh, the ones in green are what we were able to fund with the bond proceeds. So we got most of the way down that initial list. Uh, you'll see we didn't get to Alexander Wilson. That was the last one. Um, so that one remains on the list and is at the top of the new list. So the consultants have finished their evaluations. We sat down and worked together to prioritize uh, what needs are coming after the bond funding expenditures, and, and this is that list. So starting with Alexander Wilson, um, 
a big expense at Sylvan, and then the second phase of Alexander Wilson, um, we could put those together. Quite honestly, it's broken out that way because we thought we could fund Alexander Wilson in the first process. Um, but you'll see about $10.8 $10 million of, of roof expenses for ABSS, um, another 15 for HVAC expenses. Um, I, I will say those HVAC costs are kind of what it, what it would take to go in and fix it, you know, gut it, fix it, do it all the way, um, which if we have the funding is the best way to do it. If we're not there, um, then we can break that down a little bit. We can address the most pressing priorities at each school. Um, so we don't have to necessarily go one, $2 million for each school right away, but those, those are the needs to do it uh, completely. Um, so grand total of 26 million. Um, you overwhelmed him right there. That's, that's <laughs> not, not the first time, probably. Alamance County priorities, um, same amount of buildings, much smaller square footage, and we're a little bit ahead of where the school system was, so our needs aren't as great. We have three primary uh, needs that we need to do relatively quickly. That's um, the remaining work to do on the Human Services Building, um, some additional work at the J.B. Allen Courthouse, and... Um, prison annex building needs some roof work as well um so a total of 2.7 um for alamance county buildings so not nearly as big of a price tag um mostly just because they're smaller systems for the most part um so i will say that what i've gotten back from the consultants is a lot of details um I have the model years and the age and the condition of every single unit that the school system has that we have. Um, I got a lot of information in a database. It's not that helpful uh, to, to get into all those details. So I've really condensed it down for you guys. Um, just come up with this priorities list. We need to keep, keep making progress on these. Um, but if we need more information to, to get into those, be happy to help produce that for you guys. County manager, are you asking that we take any action? This is solely for We review. are not. We just wanted to bring the report back in front of you. You had only seen the top 20 list, and so we wanted you to have a more comprehensive list. We would like to take this and start um, planning for it in our longer-term CIP. That's kind of the point of this. Right. It becomes a, a document that we then are able to proceed with funding in incremental amounts. I think it's putting us on the right track to get a, a comprehensive look at everything that we need to get done to get us so that we are on a regular maintenance schedule instead of just constantly right. behind the curve. It, it helps us getting, be a little more proactive. And getting proactive. stuff where it's functional for our citizens. Yes. And I will say, um, Greg and I have been working on this uh, a lot, and our plan moving forward is to continue to update this list, continue to stay on top of it, and also to add in some of the other issues that they have. So this is just roof and HVACs. We don't have um, a list of the structural needs. We don't have those built into a comprehensive priority list, which I think we need over time. So we'll keep working on this. Um, this list is going to change a little bit as, as things happen. And, and if we don't fund it quickly, then, well, things are going to change a little bit. But our idea for this to be a living document that ideally encompasses all of the needs that they have and that we in the school system are on agreement um, of what to fund next. Just curious, is, is maintenance, uh, buildings and maintenance, correct? Is the urban buildings. Does that include their sporting, like their football fields, their tennis courts, their, their, their sports complexes? I know the bleachers have been handled at Cummins. I think there was some issues at Eastern. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, I'm just curious. Is that part of us? Is that part of our responsibility as well? Okay. It is. Thanks. Uh, we will be bringing to you in the, in the future an item about some of these elementary school facilities yeah. um, that we utilize as a county and that we're putting funding into but are still school system properties. That is, is a, doesn't make a ton of sense because the school doesn't use them as much as we do and we probably need to clean up ownership and responsibility yeah. there. Um, but for the most part, all the high school ones, the ones that they use, those are part of our facility obligation. We thank you. I have one question for you. I have two questions. 
Um, are these listed in priority order? Priority order. Lots that they're, they're, that's how they're listed? Yes. Okay, so basically what you're doing is from the green here, you're just going to go down to Alexander Wilson and then Sylvan, and that's how you're going to approach it's in it. It's a ranking order of need okay. or critical. That's what I thought. That's yeah. how you guys usually work. Uh, but I do have one last question about the one on the very bottom, Graham Middle. Brian, I'm just curious about why that price tag to do the HVAC is $3.595 million. Yeah, you're going to get out of my expertise pretty quickly. Um, we, we go to the consultant. Okay. He gives us the numbers. He's All like, right. here's what you need. Here's the number. And I tend to take his word for it. We can dig into those. I mean, I have them, but I don't have well, the ability start, start to It's only the it bottom out. list, and uh, I think it's going to do a considerable amount of time. It's probably going to uh, pass before you get to that one. I was just curious because it's higher than the rest of them that are listed. That's why I asked. No worries. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. That is curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nothing for me to do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did have a, just a couple of questions. I'm, I'm sorry oh, about I'm that. sorry. Okay. There were not. <laughs> that's bad. Sure was getting awful perky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would you go to the ABSS upcoming priorities list, please, Brian? So $26 million. 300,000 total to complete this list. Correct. Did the did the experts provide you with estimates on when these needs should be conducted? So these within their CIP is is the next 2 years. Um, okay. I don't know that we're going to get to that and I don't know that they expected that, but that was their recommendation. These are the things you should address in the next 2 years. And the ones that we've already addressed are the ones that needed immediate yes. attention. Yes. Correct. Um, a couple, a couple things. I sure would like. I think that top ten idea really worked. Absolutely. I, I sure would love to see a top ten list from the school system about. You know, obviously we, we got we got Alexander Wilson's really two projects. It's a roof and an HVAC. If that's one and two, okay. But if Sylvan roof is more important than the Alexander Wilson HVAC, I think we'd like to know that and to fold in if there are any other projects that the school system believes need to be funded before something on this list. I just think a top 10 list helps all of us focus, helps us look at revenue sources that can move those things along. I just think it makes a lot of sense. I'd like to see that. Um, when we're thinking in terms of revenue, I, I also, uh, Ms. Evans, it might be helpful for us to know maybe at the next meeting, are, are there, what the capital reserves are going to look like for ABSS? I, I don't think they're going to be a whole lot there. Um, but just what that looks like. Is there any lottery funds that that we can use in the next uh, year after the I think the 1.4 that we use from lottery for to fund the uh, the capital plan? Um, and also, you know, there's there's still money available should this board choose to use it on on unspent bond funds. There's a deadline for those; those expire. The, the we ha we would have to ask for an extension to use them. That's correct. When do you have to ask? What's the deadline to ask for an extension? So with rule of thumb, with general obligation bonds, is that you have seven years to um, issue them once they have been authorized. Voters authorized the $150 million issuance in November of 2018. So seven years from now, seven years from that date would be November 2025. Um, we can ask for an extension with the LGC, and that would give us an additional three years. I can reach out to them to find out exactly how long we would need to get that extension and what the proper uh, procedure would be. I'd like to know that just so that we this board knows its options, not that we have to do it or need to do it, but that we know we, when we can do it. And that's about 1.37 million, I think that's available. Okay. That's and fine. then some other sources would be <coughs> refunds from current projects if we don't spend as much as, as we're expecting to spend. And I think just a, an active dialogue between our organizations on when those are becoming available would help us move projects through that top 10 process and just get them funded and get them moved even in the middle of the budget cycle, I would think. So I, I, I think those are some good things to think about going forward. I agree. Well, another point, too, is I think, if I recall correctly, most of the roofs we're looking at are flat roof. And a lot of the HVA systems are on the roofs. And one of the things we're looking at is that we're repairing a roof or replacing a roof, relocating the HVA system so it's kind of 
in some of those situations, I think they're tied together. Instead of being able to say, do the roof and not do the HVAC, you kind of kind of do them both at the same time. And you're moving many off the roof to a more stable location. Right. Well, and where somebody's not walking on that roof again to punch holes. Yeah. That's the most, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. They did it. Hmm. Y'all didn't do it. Everybody did it. <laughs> Any other question, board members? We've already gone to county attorney, county manager. No, nothing to report, sir. Thanks. Missed two reports all day. We tried. <laughs> county commissioners, Ms. Thompson. I'm still curious about the things I said about last time with the diversion center or behavioral health center. Um, I guess they'll know more about that tomorrow at their Jack meeting. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I had a few things, but it's uh, running late, so I'm not going to dive into those. But I just wanted to make a uh, comment uh, about one of our uh, Alamance County employees, and I know that Tony knows exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, Ariana Lawrence, and you can help me out, Tony. I'm just drawing a blank what her title is for your board of health, for the health department, excuse me. What's what's her title? She said That's what I thought. She's like our Tory. Ariana's the sweetest lady you know, that you ever met, and she's so conscientious about her job. But she had a tragic loss in her family. She lost her eight-year-old, Oh, Dominic. gosh. It's just, a, it just breaks my heart to even talk about it. But I just wanted everybody to understand uh, that there is a uh, memorial service today for Dominic. And uh, I just just wanted the county, everyone in the county to understand that Ariana is just like, uh, she's so very valuable to the health department. And I know Tony understands mm -hmm. this probably more than anyone. So I just wanted to uh, make that comment. Thank you. When's the memorial service today? Yeah. What time? 4, 4 p.m. At, at 4 p.m. at St. Mark's. Nothing for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Nothing for me. I want to thank everybody that's been here, all the presentations. Uh, we're resuming the uh, chairs, superintendent, and county manager starting in October. Uh, so I think that's the first Wednesday monthly starting in October. Thank you. Uh, I feel like the two, our two boards are working much, much closer together uh, and accomplishing a lot. And I think it has to do with somewhat changing personnel, a lot as to the gentleman sitting on your right. Uh, and I appreciate your moving getting things done uh, and under cost as opposed to continually asking for more money. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, nice work, Greg. Amen. Anything else? Do I have a motion, motion to... Uh, <laughs> second. Motion. Uh, everyone that agrees... I should have heard three <laughs> seconds. Thomas is the only one who wants to stay. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.tv TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. 
Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.